Welcome, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes. My name is Erica. I'm Gutsy Gibbon, and I am one of your hosts for today's show, Skep Talk. Today is October the 16th, 2023, and um, I want to invite everybody out there who wants to talk about the things that they maybe don't know or dislike about evolutionary theory or the state of the cosmos. It's spooky season, so aliens, Bigfoot, ghosts, all of that is appropriate. This is about answering questions about um, the, the mysteries of the universe and offering you an answer from the skeptical side. Um, the number that you're going to call is going to be in the side chat, first of all. You can find it there. That's a link. And it's 720-619-2288. As I said, my name is Erica Gutzig. I'm in here on YouTube. My specialties are in human evolution and primatology, and I am here with Dr. Aaron Adair. So please, Aaron, take it away. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started here. All right. Yeah. So yeah, my name is Aaron. Uh, my PhD is in physics from The Ohio State University. And yes, the The is part of the official name. Truly, our <laughs> my school is the definite article. Um, yeah. So yeah, so primary research there in physics and education research. Uh, day job as a data scientist in the defense sector while also doing continuing research at MIT. Uh, and I dabble in uh, skepticism, religious studies, the intersection of science and religion, which I have a couple of books in that uh, area showing attempts to try to get past a few conflicts, but showing it's a lot harder than you think. Cool. All right. So everybody, as a friendly reminder, me and Aaron are going to be here. We are going to be answering calls from you guys, and we will also be reading super chats at the end of all things here. Um, and depending on if it's like $5 or more, that's going to be like a definite read. And then that typically scales up. That's normally how Jimmy does it. Um, but in the meantime, I hope everybody out there is doing well as we kind of get ready to take some of these, some of these calls. Again, that's going to be Two or sorry, seven two zero six one nine two two eight eight. Aaron, how's your day been so far? What have you been up to while we wait on getting oh, started here? Honestly, it's been a bit crazy. That uh, I was literally up doing work on Sunday for my job till two a.m. and mm -hmm. still did my nine to five sort of today, and not as productive as I wanted to because of other stuff in the way. So I did a whole lot of. I think in the army they would call hurry, hurry, uh, hurry up and wait. <laughs> Hurry up and wait. I know, I know the um the the wonders of random crap getting in the way of trying to get work done. I was trying to study for my comps. Um, I'm getting ready. I'm a third year PhD student, so I'm like getting ready to take like my big test. I like submitted all of my papers, and my my uh, committee is writing up their questions and blah 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 blah. So I was sitting there studying. My husband comes up the stairs, and he's like my car like will not start and we need to get it towed but we have to push it into an area where it's actually able to be towed so that's out of like our little cul-de-sac so you know i had to i had to bring the the big gun show out to the driveway so we could heave ho this thing it was pretty i'm not gonna lie to you guys it was pretty impressive i was i was pushing this car solo style it's a little sedan but i still was impressed with my you know it's it's not easy having chimp like strength in my six foot 10 body. How, how tall am I? I'm very tall. Now I just have to ask, did you get the car up to 88 miles per hour? <laughs> I did not. No, I think I barely got it. Maybe. I mean, oh gosh, I don't even think it would, would read on a speedometer. I was like, blow, <laughs> you know, blowing my back out, pushing this thing. And my husband, like, well, once it was the two of us together, it was like really sweet. Um, but you know, it's like a stick. So he was sitting in there like trying to maneuver us to this reasonable spot to get the toe. And then it was like, there's a Leafs game tonight. So for you hockey fans out there, my husband's a big Maple Leafs fan. So I don't know if you're into sports, Aaron. I'm not, I do not care about sports, but he loves them. <laughs> uh, funny enough. I don't follow too much, but my wife basically said, Hey, I'm going to buy tickets for the Boston Bruins game. So Saturday night we hit the town and fortunately uh, I'm in the Boston area and the Boston team won. So uh, we got to go home safely. <laughs> nice. Yeah. You weren't worried about uh, uh, the unruly, fran unruly fans. It's like a, um, 
Yeah, I've seen some of those, like, especially in Philadelphia, like when fans get like really intense, right? It looks like oh. a, um, it looks like a chimp troop raiding the adjacent community. Like people go absolutely oh. berserk. <laughs> Oh, uh, I did my undergrad at Michigan State University and also somewhat infamous for its uh, party culture. And uh, yeah, it's usually more dangerous if the football team does win. If everyone loses, uh, then it's like yeah. everyone just gets depressed and orders pizza. <laughs> yeah, and it has a couple beers and, and calls it a night. I, I find that to be like, you know, again, like I don't have any stake in like who wins or not. So I'm always just like, I want them to win because then my husband's in a great mood. And then if they lose, he's really sad and that bums me out. So and then I'm like, yay, you know, go team. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think? You think we should get started? Let's see what we if got. We have yeah. mind, do we have anything, Arden? What's going on? Uh, yeah, there are two. Looks like two calls in the line right now, uh, and mm -hmm. another one being screened. So there are at least three spots open for other people who want to connect. Cool. What What are our calls about? What are, What are we chatting? Uh oh. Okay, I didn't know if you had a call in studio. Uh, does Jimmy usually? Okay. Okay. Yeah, Jimmy usually does. Him or Forrest, usually whoever I'm with, but I don't know how to screen the calls yet. Gotcha. So. No, no problem. Uh, I just didn't realize that. So, okay, uh, let's take first. Then we've got to Neil in Australia, an atheist, asking, uh, has any organism ever gone from breathing in water, gills, then gone to breathing air with lungs, then back into water? So here's to Neil. You are live. To Neil. Neil. Do we gotcha? Hello. You do. Hi, how are you? How I'm we great. Doing? Thank you so much for having me. Good to hear. Good to hear. So tell us a little bit about your question. So uh, I'm a fan of evolution and stuff. I, I try to learn some stuff, but I haven't been able to figure out if there's ever been a living organism that has done the full circle going from, you know, fish-like to being able to breathe in water, going up onto land, being able to breathe air like lungs, and then going all the way back uh, to being able to breathe underwater. I know there's whales and dolphins and turtles and, and perhaps insects that kind of don't care whether they're in water or land, but I'm wanting to know if you know of any organisms that have done the full circle, gone all the way back properly. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. Off the top of my head, I would imagine that if there was one that had done the, the full circle, right, like starting off with the equipment for pulling oxygen from the water itself and then coming onto land, kind of reorganizing things because that swim bladder is what's going to be sort of accepted into being a, a, a lung system, a, a pulmonary, or pulmonary, excuse me, um, uh, basically just the, the ability to pull oxygen from the air, right? And then when it goes back, right, they tend to stay, whether we're talking about like marine reptiles or your cetaceans or turtles or even lungfish, things that go back to being pretty committed to the water. Generally, they just stick with the air, right? Because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and they have some really interesting ways of, of getting around it, right? Because like the, the benefits of organisms being able to actually pull the oxygen directly from the water seem to not be necessary for a lot of our air breathing um, marine animals like seals or even our deep divers, like, you know, sperm whales and things of that nature. So it seems like whatever the pressure is, once things kind of return to the sea, it doesn't necessarily push it all the way into developing, <clears throat> redeveloping that initial uh, means by which to, to breathe underwater because it's not necessary. You know, evolution, remember, is not necessarily going for like what's going to be the absolute best ideal form in this given environment. It's what's going to be ideal in that given environment, given what we have access to, right? Because there's no forethought involved. So typically you're going to see an alteration of existing structures. And I suppose that it's just more difficult to go um, from from lungs back into kind of like a like a swim bladder type organ um, in our in our marine animals today. What, what do you think, Aaron? Do you want to add anything to that? I was just having the thought in my head, uh, not so much in, like in evolutionary times, but even for the individual, I was just thinking like, well, isn't that kind of like how it works for frogs? They start as tadpoles living in the water, then become land-based, and then return to the water to um, breed and have the next population. But I don't know if tadpoles actually suck oxygen out of the water or if they just uh, get it from the surface. I don't know enough about tadpoles on that. Well, I think most amphibians too, um, at least in their adult form at the end of the metamorphosis, right? They tend to pull oxygen from their skin. Like they, they 
they can kind of absorb it either way. It doesn't necessarily have to be like the full kind of um, lungs, sweet lungs and, you know, trachea and things like that that you see uh, in really committed terrestrial fauna. Uh, I wonder too, I think if anything would do it, if anything has done it, my bet would be crustaceans. My bet would be members of crustacea would be your best bet for something that has become terrestrial and then either gone back fully committed to to being underwater, right? Or something that maybe has um, the set for both, like modern lungfish do. Because there are organisms that have kind of like partially committed to land, but then they maintain the the equipment that they need to, to live in the water and to, to pull oxygen from the water. Uh, and in fact, what's kind of interesting is that when we look at what spurred some of the first tetrapods, like, or pre-tetrapods, like Eustinopteron, these lobe-finned fish that are living at the beginning of the Devonian, um, they have kind of the, the start of the tetrapod pattern where they've got like a humerus and a radius and an ulna, but they don't really have the carpals just yet. And they don't really have those fully developed pectorals. Uh, but what they do have is they have their, their gills, they can pull oxygen from the water, and they dwell in brackish environments, which is like kind of a perfect selective pressure to be able to also pull it, like oxygen from the air. Right. And um, again, this is, this is a, adapted from that swim bladder. So you've already got an organism that's kind of sacrificing the swim bladder because they, they tend to walk kind of along the bottom. Most lungfish do today. Uh, so modern sarcopterygians do that. So what do you need the swim bladder, bladder for? Well, any pressure that's going to help you be more efficient at pulling oxygen from your environment is, is going to be selected for. You've got brackish water. That's pretty oxygen poor, but you've got all the air right above you. So, you know, it, it's going to depend entirely. But I think that's a really interesting question. I'd have to look into that. But crustaceans, though, would be my best bet. Of course, it would be the lobster overlords that would figure it out. Always, yeah. Always, it's always those decapods. Actually, I just realized, you know, there is one <laughs> and, other um, um, advanced creature as well, uh, Kevin Costner in the movie <laughs> Waterworld. Um, the humans there do, oh, at yeah, least some yeah. of them do develop a mutation. So uh, in the Waterworld scenario, maybe. Uh, if Hollywood is to be believed and they have evolution correct. And I've seen X-Men. They, they understand evolution, right? Yeah, sure. Can I admit something it, 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 incredibly water. cringy about, like, the Water Waterworld show? Yeah. I, um, I think I watched it when I was, like, fairly young, maybe five. And me and my siblings used to swim quite a lot. We, you know, down here in Australia, you have to swim a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. and, uh, my sister could hold her breath for a really long time, way longer than me. And she, we used to think that she was growing gills behind her ears. Cause she had like a few ridges there. And we're like, Oh my gosh, if you keep practicing, you'll grow gills like the guy in water world. Yeah. You're doing like a, like a Lamarckian, <laughs> a Lamarckian, uh, procession, right? Like as long as you keep trying, eventually you'll get a little bit closer to being able to breathe underwater and then all your kids can, right? Um, that's yeah. that's really fun. That um that reminds me too. There's a really cool mutation in I I think it's the Bajau people. I I can't I believe they're Indon it's an Indonesian people group, but I I can't quite remember. Uh, I think it's called the PMDE10 mutation, something along those lines. Uh, their spleens are huge. This this people group has enormous spleens, and they have can hold their breath for a really long time. And like the way that they subsist and the way that they've subsisted for a very long time traditionally is by free diving. So as, as a people group, they they go off their like sort of, um, they've got like a nice shelf sort of near like a, an oceanic shelf kind of, or like a, a divot. I'm not sure how deep it goes per se, but they go and they free dive for things like clams and, you know, other other edible marine life. And then they, they bring that back and that's mostly where they get their calories from. So it's like, okay, you know, that's a, a mutation that I don't know if you gave it long enough, if you would fully commit back to the ocean and like develop structures that can pull oxygen directly from the, from the solution, directly from the water around you. But certainly that seems to be almost analogous to what happened with, with whales and other diving marine mammals, right? Is you just get a selective pressure for being able to hold your breath longer and longer and longer and longer. And when you can hold your breath as long as a sperm whale can, well, you don't even need gills at that point, do you? No, no. Um, uh, I know since I'm an atheist, it's, you know, we, you guys prioritize theists, but if I could leave you off on one last kind of, not so much a question, but asking if you've ever heard of the uh, the silver fox experiment. 
Yeah, it's a really cool one. It's one of my favorite like um, ways to show people just how quickly domestication for one and huge changes can change in the phenotype of oh and 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 ex other expressions like behavior of an organism just by selecting for one trait, which is friendliness. I think it's just an amazing thing that everyone should look up. Well, it's so it's so fascinating too because so for those of you out there who might not know, the silver fox experiment was I forget the name of the guy, but he's a um, he's a, a a guy who basically focused on breeding friendly foxes in Russia, right? So he has this farm full of foxes, and he specifically would take the foxes that were the friendliest towards people, and you know foxes are notoriously pretty not friendly to people, but he would selectively breed the ones that would tolerate human presence the most, and I think it was like. 30 generations, don't quote me on that, but certainly less than 60, um, that the that the foxes were not only so friendly towards humans that they would tolerate them, but they actually behaved analogously to dogs. And you would think that that would be where it stopped, right? But as it turns out, that selection for friendly behavior has a lot of like hanger on characteristics like floppy ears and a tail that wags and um, more expressive eyebrows, characteristics that also show up in like canines, like members of Canis, right? So dogs and um, and wolves and things like that. So it seems like there's something in the family Canidae, so of, of foxes and wolves and Maine wolves and all these guys together, that when you select for friendliness, you get floppy ears and a wagging tail and, and all of the things that we sort of associate with domestication. It's so cool how quickly something like that can happen when you when you just focus on selective breeding. And I think it's really telling because like dogs are the first animal that we domesticated or rather they might have been they might have domesticated us right like it might have gone both ways a, a mutual a mutually beneficial relationship but like they show up on the scene like thirty six thousand years ago um as as these dog wolf hybrids like these things that sort of look like they're they're um more domesticated big more um neonatal features like bigger eyes and like reduced rostral length the snout is shorter and they're smaller and it's just like yeah, they've like been with us for a long time, and it's. I guess it's no wonder that we find those characteristics so appealing. They've they've been around for quite a while, but that's a. I love that experiment as well. And and I love that it also made a little bit of a statement on nature versus nurture, and that they would also take the uh, fertilized embryos from friendly foxes and put them into the more aggressive foxes that were like their control group. And the the kit that was born and then raised by an aggressive mother, the kit watched the aggressive mother acting nasty to humans, but still ended up being dog-like and loving humans because its genes were from the friendly foxes. And that kind of makes some influence into, like, your genes are stronger than who raised you a little bit, at least in these foxes. I don't know if that applies to humans. <laughs> Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, human human behavior is like, there's a lot going on there. So I would imagine with people, it can be a little, quite a bit, I would say more more complicated than that. But like, I, oh, I do think it's it's adorable to imagine these, these little foxes like fighting against the status quo in their little pack where they're like, no, no, these humans are great. Like, <laughs> it's pretty cute. Thank you so much for um, answering my questions and, and tolerating my um, my uh, nerding out over the silver fox experiment. Have hope you guys have a great rest of your day and cool. You as well. You have great taste in experiments. Thank you. <laughs> Man, that experiment is actually so cool. Like Aaron, what what would I've... you say? So you know, I could like go on and on about my favorite experiments. What where are you sitting with your like number one fave? Okay, well, I think you want me to be a bit more specific in uh, evolution because if you tell a physicist about favorite experiments, you're going to get some very different answers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I want to hear the physicist example. I want to hear okay, your favorite okay. physical experiment. Ooh. So I'll give you one that might be a little bit controversial. Uh, hmm. The Millikan oil drop experiment. Okay. Uh, so... There was an interesting problem at the beginning of the 20th century. We knew about things like electric charge. We had some very basic quantum ideas sorts of things, but we did have a big problem. We could tell from experiments that what was the relationship between these things called electrons and that uh, they have an electric charge, they have a mass, but we could only say what the electron 
ratio, the electron to mass ratio was. We didn't know what the individual values were. So it's like, is it three to four? Is it six to eight? You know, we don't know what the numerator and denominator are. We just know what the reduced fraction is. So trying to find some experimental ways. So uh, in the uh, Millikan oil drop experiment, it's literally, as the name suggests, you're dropping these little droplets of oil uh, under magnification and into a strong electric field. And the idea is that you're spraying these little oil droplets. And in that process, it strips off electrons. And so you'll have this oil droplet with just maybe one, two, three electrons ripped off from it, giving it a small overall right. electric charge with an electric field. And then you can basically like raise it and then turn off the electric field and drop it. And then you can see how quickly it's dropping without the electric field, how fast it is. And then you can basically see the stepwise function of, oh, as the droplets had more and more electrons stripped off, their rate of being accelerated by the electric field changes. And this was like the way we figured out what was the electric charge initially of the electron. And then from there, the mass. Uh, and the experiment is easy enough to do that. I literally, when I taught high school, we actually had the apparatus in the back room. So I had my high school seniors uh, try to operate that and, you know, try to repeat the experiment. Uh, a little bit too noisy to get anything uh, Nobel Prize worthy, but uh, <laughs> uh, there was some good <laughs> stuff so there. Cool, the contra yeah, the controversial part, though, is we still had his journal articles, or not his journal, I'm sorry, his uh, notebook from Millikan. Yeah. And Later on, like when uh, other methods came along to measure the mass in the electric uh, charge of the electron, they saw that, hey, as the error bars got smaller and smaller, it excluded Millikan's original research. And usually the idea is you start with big error bars and then, you know, you get better and better, but uh, they right. should all be in the same range. So why weren't they crossing over and looking at the old notebooks? And we see, oh, he wasn't including all of his data. Oh, so there was a little wow. bit of what we might nowadays call a bit of malfeasance, but I mean, not enough to yeah. say that electrons don't exist. It's not like that evil, but enough to say right. this would not be kosher today, um, but apparently good enough in the 1910s, no. 1920s to get the Nobel Prize. Wow, that's wild. So so he wins the Nobel Prize in the 1920s. And then when do they when do they suss out that there's been a little bit of um, da data oh. massaging, one might say? Oh, I think... Uh, I have to look at the details of it. I think it's well after World War II, especially after one, a ton of money is thrown into nuclear physics because of the bomb. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then all the yeah. other continuing research in high energy particle physics, which also is a little bit close to me. When I was at Ohio State, I spent a couple years working at CERN at the Large Hadron Collider. Ooh. So um, I had a tiny, 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 extremely tiny contribution to what goes on there and um, a little bit of the equipment has you know gone into the machine but the most famously i was around there just before they declared the discovery of the higgs boson oh wow that's so cool that is wild so so what's it like like what was it like being present for that like being there for the work that they did like with the large hadron collider like what what was it what did you say like what was a day in the life <laughs> So, I mean, for the most part, like what I was doing uh, was I was actually going to be working on what we call the optics of the detectors that would be going in uh, in this next upgrade. So when we say the optics, um, you know, it sounds like we're building a telescope, but how do you, you know, take a telescope and look at individual particles? Uh, instead, what we had was basically a whole bunch of sensors and you need a sensor that basically will light up when a charged particle goes through but it's strong enough to basically be bombarded by particles bouncing off each other at 99.9999999% the speed of light. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the uh, detector of choice, the scintillator of choice is artificial diamond. Okay. Wow. Uh, and uh, also the components, the electric components are also next to this beam of extremely high energy. So one of the things I was doing there was uh, to actually basically toughen up the electronics by taking our electronics that we built in Ohio, fly it over to Geneva and stick it in one of the um, earlier ends of the um, uh, particle beam and basically just have it whacked with high energy um, protons um, and basically just hammering Science. it and getting, you know, like, and, and, and the weird thing is you hammer it and you can look at like the quality electronic is getting worse and worse, but then you take it out and then you start running current through it and it actually heals itself. It's called annealing. And it's basically a way of getting the, the electronics okay. Um, radiation hardened. So I had a little bit of uh, fun doing that for a couple of summers. And every time you're walking around there, you have a, a dosimeter around your chest uh, because they want to make sure you're not getting too much radiation. Now, right. when I was there, honestly, I got probably 10 times more radiation just flying over the Atlantic than uh, at the facilities <laughs> there. But some <laughs> folks are probably have more exposure than I would have for most of the stuff I did. Yeah. 
you got to play it safe, right? I mean, I feel like it, if you're oh, yeah. working, if you're working with the Hadron Collider, right? Like you, you want to have everybody feeling comfortable. And if you have to have a dosimeter yeah. around your neck to feel a little bit more comfortable, man, sure, why not? Is yeah. so? Is it true? But, I, but, you know, this is a dumb question, but I read somewhere like, is it true that the that the Large Hadron Collider had an incident with a weasel at one point that like threw the whole thing off? Uh, I don't think it was specifically a weasel, but one of the issues was like, I think one of the cooling systems had an issue and at least one theory at some point was that a bird was flying over and dropped a, a piece of bread it. that like clogged thing. That, that, that was <laughs> at least the so story specific. going around at the time. <laughs> that is so specific. So they like walk in there and they're I, like, does anybody smell toast? <laughs> what, what could it possibly be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, it was much worse, like when they first turned the machine on back in 2008, um, one of the components wasn't quite working as well. And so it got hot. And when I say hot, yeah. I mean, like eight degree, uh, eight Kelvin. Jesus. So hot. I know. I, so exactly. Yeah. But I mean, it's hot in that it meant that spot was too warm to continue to have um, superconductivity. And that becomes the big problem that, oh, now you have current going through this wire, it gets truly hot, and that causes the gas around to expand and basically caused a mini explosion that pretty much shut down the the project for like repairs for about a year or two. That would be absolutely terrifying to to be present for you. You're like, okay, I don't know what that sound was, but we should probably get out yeah. of here. The, I think actually what was oh, the most man. terrifying was for like the seven year graduate student who was like, okay, they finally turned the machine on. I can finally get some data to do my PhD research. And then boom. All right. It's going to take another two years before I can even start my research. Uh, oh, that's absolutely yeah. devastating. That is absolutely devastating. Wow. Yeah. Well, so on, that chip, on that chipper note, <laughs> let's take another call. <laughs> On the note of not having to redo our our PhD uh, data collection, because I am exactly (laughs) there right now, and I think I would just walk into the sea if I had to redo my data collection at the point where I'm at right now. I actually almost did that once. I almost like accidentally deleted all of my data, and I'm like, no, no. But I was like, oh, Dropbox, you you saved me. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) Okay, Arden, what do we have? What's what's lurking on the line? We have uh, Cindy from New York uh, wants to know, can scientists accurately retrospectively know when tsunamis occurred? You've got Sam in Georgia, an atheist who wants to know if evolution is all from one common ancestor, how did speciation? <laughs> and uh, Time from Washington who wants to know, is there a relativistic solution to young earth creationism? What do you think, Aaron? What sounds most interesting to you? Oh, well, if you use the R word, I'm going to obviously get excited, but uh, <laughs> uh, you're, <laughs> okay, well, you're controlling the assist. All, all right, right. All right. Let's pop onto it then. Okay. You've got time from Washington. Uh, oh, missed the button. There we go. Time, you are live. Oh, well, if you use the R word, I'm going to obviously get excited, but. Uh... <laughs> oh, caller, uh, it sounds like you've got, you're watching the show. If you could turn that off, that way we don't have the feedback. Okay. That would be great. Yeah, I, I tried to turn the background off. Thank you. I was just listening to the show. Wonderful. Welcome. Well, let's hear the question. What have you got, Time? Hey, Erica, how you doing? So uh, oh, I, don't, doing okay. I don't want to talk about thermodynamics, but I saw you had like, you've got multiple really cool uh, sort of thermodynamics videos uh, where you try to eliminate young earth creationism by physics, energetic considerations. So I thought I would uh, ask myself the question, could I find a simple relativistic solution to the whole issue? Uh, So if I imagine a very powerful, maybe intelligent, maybe not very intelligent being traveling away at very close to the speed of light, or even by, it doesn't have to be away from, looking at a four billion year creation cycle for the earth, could they not travel very close to the speed of light and experiencing experience that as six days, say? Without so all the you... problems associated with thermodynamics, you know, all the, uh, in your video you cite thousands of uh, atomic explosions per acre 
et cetera, to get the thermodynamics to work. It's not really necessary. The so, special so, relativity so solution up, just solves the problem. So to back up with on the question a little bit, the primary issue, uh, let's, let's just take a step back. So the issue for those of you who are wondering out in the audience here is like, I call this the heat problem. And I've, I've, this is not me who came up with the heat problem. I'd love to take credit for it. It was actually other young earth creationists who were like, okay, so we have 4.5 billion years worth of processes here on earth and out in the cosmos, um, you know, expanding into 13 billion years worth of processes. And we have approximately 6,000 years of time if they want to take the, the literal interpretation of the Bible, which I think is incorrect hermeneutically as well. But let's just let's just take that at its word there for a moment. The problem is that there's a great many, there are a great many, excuse me, uh, processes that go on during that time period, the vast majority of which release heat as a byproduct, right? So radioactive decay, as I'm sure Aaron can tell you, right, releases heat. Every time you've got um, an unstable isotope decaying into its more stable daughter product, heat is released. So you're cramming 4.5 billion years worth of radioactive decay into a single year. You've got to explain the speed of light, right? So how are we getting um, images of light, I guess I should say, from you know, objects that are, you know, thousands of light years away if the earth is only 6,000 years old, right? Or we could talk about the, the heat that's released in the concretion and formation of limestone or the hardening of magma or all of the impact events that we find throughout the geologic column. And what some creationists have done, young earth creationists have done to try to explain this is kind of what you're talking about their time. Um, I believe it's Michael Ord who does this, but it might be Baumgartner, both young earth creationists. And they propose like a sort of, you're gonna love this, Aaron, a white hole cosmology. So the idea is to solve the, the the speed of light problem, right? So like we're getting the light from these these stellar objects, the stellar bodies, and things like that, um, hundreds and thousands of light years away. So maybe what God did is He made Earth last, kind of at the center of a of a white hole. So everything else is kind of expanding outwards, and and everything outside of the Earth has experienced that billions of years worth of time, uh, but the Earth has not because it's at the center of the white hole, and like. I'll just say this before passing it over to Aaron. That is fine if you want to use that to, to solve the, the speed of light, right? But it doesn't do anything for the heat problem because the creationists try to explain the geologic column with their accelerated nuclear decay. And they propose that that accelerated nuclear decay happened not just at creation, but also during Noah's flood when the earth was formed, cre creation was complete. And then they they sort of um, invoke the Noachian deluge to create the, the geologic column from like the Cambrian roughly uh, to the Cretaceous, sometimes even the end of the Eocene, sometimes even the Holocene. That's an obscene amount of heat from, from just geologic processes alone. So the white hole cosmology is miraculous and, and kind of just so in my opinion. I don't even know if it would solve your speed of light problem, but, but the main issue is you're still gonna have to deal with the majority of that heat for the geologic column outside of the creation week. So Aaron, thoughts? <laughs> All right, uh, I'm gonna take this in a little bit of reverse order that I'll start with the white hole stuff. And then I think what was related to time's original question, because one is more general relativity and the other one is special relativity. So white hole, massive gravitational field causing huge time distortion. Uh, one would think we would have noticed this gigantic gravitational differential that would cause time dilations on the order of, you know, factors of billions that you'd think that basically there'd be so much warping of light coming in from these outside sources, you would have noticed is like, you know, when we first tried to actually prove general relativity by seeing how much the sun that starlight behind it, uh, you know, it's a pretty small, uh, small and subtle amount. And if you go by the sun, the amount of time dilation to get from that is also relatively small. To get a factor of billions to explain, uh, or, or at least I should say millions, to get you know between the young Earth creation and timeline and the universal one, it's like, yeah, we probably would have noticed the uh, absolutely gargantuan levels of light bending from all these other outside sources, uh, to mm. say the least. Uh, that would be one thing I would expect. Um, uh, on the other hand, so uh, time's thing here about, so I think time, what you're basically saying is, assume God is moving away from Earth at 99.99999% the speed of light, some extremely large factor. So you get a st large relativistic effect. So that way you get that time slowdown. That's your basic uh, premise you want to test, right? 
Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be God if you don't want it to be. But I'm looking none of the exotic white hole stuff or or extreme gravitational fields or anything, or anything like that necessary. Just whoever it is that's reporting the issue just has to be moving at highly relativistic speeds compared to the Earth. And then depending on what on what time frame you like, you know, if you want it to be six days or six months or six minutes. That will all you have to do is solve that uh, delta t prime equals t over gamma, that simple uh, mm -hmm. special relativity equation to get the speed necessary, the velocity, if you will, yeah. to there, get it to problem, be the, though, the time you want the observer to be. Right. There is one problem though with that is that if the observer is moving away from us at bazillions of miles per hour, and bazillions <laughs> is a totally scientific word. Uh, have them move at absurdly mm -hmm. fast speeds, close to the speed of light. And if we had extremely good eyes and we could look at their watch as they're zipping by away, their watch would look like it's going extremely slow. But the converse is not what you'd expect. The observer on that ship looking back at Earth would say, oh, they're moving away from me at bazillions of miles per hour. And they would see time going super slow on Earth. So it wouldn't be that time would zip by for them and what would only look like a few years for them is millions of years there for them would be like a few minutes uh, have gone by for me and time has barely even clicked on that other world at all. Um, you don't actually get that effect just from moving away. To really get that effect, you'd also have to throw in a lot of acceleration and you get things like, uh, if you've ever heard of the yes, twin paradox. Agreed, agreed. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. Yeah. So you've got to accelerate. It doesn't have to be away necessarily, even. It can just it can be an arbitrary direction. So it's true. The very powerful being, whatever it was, would have to accelerate to the appropriate near near speed of light velocity. And then you could they would also have the one other problem, though, please. to be... Uh, there's a, one other major problem, though, is that even if you can somehow like try to work out the time length issue, you still have the order of operations that's still a bit off. Like you still have the earth created before the sun and the moon, uh, whether that is five minutes apart or 5 billion years apart, the order is still wrong. So you don't fix that problem with any amount of special relativity. Okay. So that well, is a separate problem. I'm hoping Erica will say, uh, uh, sorry, that's a sick given. We'll say uh, the special relativity thing could do the six day solution. And now asking about the ordering is a slightly different question. But you've got a PhD in mm. physics, so you're ready for my answer if you want it, which is that you can reorder as you like using accelerations according to general relativity. That I, I wasn't intending to call about that, but since you ask, this is a set of calculations. And in fact, I guess Genesis 1 and 2 give different orderings. I'm not really, you know, I've read the Bible, but a long time ago, and I'm, you know, only somewhat interesting to me. Uh, you could get an accelerated path that will allow you to set the orderings as you please. Although, I, as I say, I'm not calling about that. I wanted to solve Erica's associated thermodynamics issue with this so, relatively simple special relativity solution. Give it so to me, Erica. Come on, get it. <laughs> I was going to say the problem with it, though, is that most of those thermal issues that you're having are not coming from the creation week. They're not coming from that time period, right? They're coming from significantly later in time, according, like if we're working with the young earth creationist perspective, and that's typically where I talk about this, this heat problem, it's during that year long flood that they have to accelerate all the processes within the geologic column that all of these thermal issues come to light. And they're not no, a no, result. No, no, I, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't go think ahead. Can, I don't think you can get around them, even invoking relativity because these these are a myriad of different processes that have to speed up not just in tandem but relative to one another right so the process of the continents moving apart and slamming into each other race car speeds during the, the middle of the Noachian deluge from you know rodinia to pangaea to the the modern uh configuration of the continents that's releasing a ton of heat via friction and that has to occur stepwise with the radioactive decay of the elements, with the um, the dendrochronology that we have, with the ice cores, with the orbiting of the Earth and its um, 
precession, I think. The, the wobble is the Earth um, moves around the sun. It's like the orbital monsoon hypothesis, right? That leaves a specific type of, of calcite signature in caves based off of the, the oxygen content, right? Like all of this has to happen in tandem, stepwise with one another. It releases a ton of heat, yes, but there's also no mechanism to speed all of these up in such a way as to give the illusion of age. No, no, uh, it's Dr. also worth Adair, noting you, another you issue. Must, you oh, you sorry, must go ahead. inform Erica that you can select the, the time period that you wish using the Actually, velocity that's a problem that you that, achieve uh, according to You're not going to be able to get around with and special the relativity. The, the, the issues she just cites go away. The physics happens naturally as it is. It's just that the observer sees it at whatever time period you like. So if you like a six-day creation, a problem that but it really took a million years, it, or if you like uh, 5,000 years no. to be the same as as 4 billion years on Earth, no problem. Select so time, your let's let, reference let's let respond real quick. He, he wanted to have a comment on that real quick, and I want to make sure that, that yeah. we've got a nice back and forth here. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, yeah. So the thing, though, is with special relativity and that you are going to affect maybe what the observer sees, but you still have to explain what's happening in the reference frame of all of the other heat processes going on. And the problem is that all those heat processes have to be dealt with over what's happening in our reference frame. And in our reference frame, we can tell no matter what any other observer is doing elsewhere in the universe, we can't fit that much heat being delivered off in a few thousand years. Uh, it needs to be out over billions of years because otherwise uh, the levels of energy, I, I had to do this for a comparison for myself because when you, I remember the video you had Erica with the very large numbers with the very large number of joules. And I had to remind myself of another calculation I did. If the Death Star came by, fired its um, super laser, and that is the official term, the super laser of the Death Star, mm. the energy needed there, how does that compare? And the heat problem is only 1% of a Death Star uh, ignition. But we are talking basically like Rogue One levels of energy destruction, and no outside observer is going to explain that away and just say the people on there just didn't notice because someone could time dilate in another uh, reference frame. In our reference frame, the problem is um, huge. Yeah, so uh, let it take the 4 billion years in the Earth's reference frame. And then you simply solve the special relativity equation for the length of time you would like the observer writing the book to be. No alteration in the physics and the thermodynamics is necessary at all. It completely solves the problem without this heat issue at all. Just let the well, normal so processes take as long as you wish and then go at the correct velocity and report it at the length of time you wish to have it. Come on, this is the, the, so basic, uh, the basic result of special relativity. Now, come on. Come so on. I've actually been saying, no, it though, doesn't work that way. Yeah, and oh, additionally, <laughs> like, people, people are present on the surface of the Earth, right? Like, your, your relativity isn't going to fix the fact that, like, your observer isn't god for all of this right your observers are also every living thing on the planet including the the big wooden boat right because again like this this has to happen twice according to the younger creationists and and that's who we're dealing with here like you know you could you could do this for anything you could say it's 600 years if you want to it doesn't really matter um you're dealing with a yeah. fraction of the actual time that that we're we're looking at but within young earth creationism you've got two separate events right you've got creation where they speed up the the clocks of everything in order to cram um, four billion odd years into their their creation week. Then you've got like a regular twelve hundred odd years, something like that plays out, and then everything speeds up again, also in stepwise during the year of the flood to get you that last five hundred million years from from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, right? So you've got these two separate scenarios. The first one you might be able, if you really want to write that off as relativity, like I don't know enough about relativity to say, I just know that based off what Aaron said here, that doesn't seem feasible even still. But moving on to the, the second set, the, the Noaki and Deluge, right? You can't do it then because the whole planet is full of, of denizens. You can't afford to vaporize the crust. You know, um, what is it? Like two dozen times, something of, something of that nature. Um, and there is no way to get that extreme amount of heat off the planet within the lifetime of the people that are on the boat. So you've got to have a separate relativity at play, a separate dilation at play for the planet itself and then for the boat? Is that what the suggestion is? 
No, no, I'll sort of close with this. Look, the thermodynamics issues that you have are generally solved very simply by choosing the velocity reference frame according to the equations of special relativity. You, you can get the observer to observe at the length of time you wish while leaving the normal physics on Earth alone. It can appear to take 4 billion years on Earth, and it can appear to take 5,000 years or 5 days or whatever you like by selecting the correct velocity. And if you don't think that's true, what I would recommend if you're a YouTuber is to look at some simple uh, special relativity YouTube uh, videos or get a book called Special Relativity Calculations. This is definitely correct. You do not have to affect the the uh, thermodynamics of uh, so on Earth. I, We're well, just I, talking I about the out observer. That, uh, That's about going, all I have to I, say I on the topic. Out a little bit of I, I really appreciate time, your listening. Time, I, I time, do, I, time. I do. Hey, time. Hey, time. Hey, time. Time. Uh, can you let our hosts speak, please? They're trying to cut in, and this is yeah, a show sorry. where we have a back and forth. So. Sorry. So Aaron, I, I just need to yeah. point out there's a bit of a, a of arrogance where like I'm literally a PhD in physics and I yeah, I've taught I special relativity. So tell me, go watch a YouTube video is pretty high up in the arrogance uh, ladder of things. Okay, well I would cite uh, a relativity paper that I published, but I, I don't want to dox myself. I I, I would just uh, what suggest journal? that you go ahead. You go ahead and get yourself a text on on uh, uh, introduction to special relativity. Work out the time dilation equations for yourself. I have, and uh, and uh, and or you can pick up the meaning of relativity by Albert Einstein. Ah. But that's largely general. How about relativity. this one? You you decide how, how you one? want to do it. Yeah. So, Tom, you're you're How saying that you've authored a paper here. on relativity. What do you want? Do you want? Are you the sole author on the paper? Do you want to just? You want to send the paper to to Arden so we can take a little look, see at it without doxing you? Would that make you feel better? Because if you've authored no, a no, paper I, on I want you. No, I want you to. I want you to look up the equations. This is basic special relativity we're talking about here. This is not. Uh, this is not uh, that complex. Anyway, I, I, I appreciate your time. And uh, I just wanted you to understand, Erica, that there's an easy solution to your thermodynamics problem that doesn't involve death rays or giant collections of atomic bombs. Or It just leaves the processes, and you just observe it at a certain relativistic speed, and you're okay. It all works out without the extreme physics or white holes or atomic bomb level heat dissipation or anything. Well, while we try to suss out the, the relativity paper that you authored or co-authored, I think that it would be um, smart of you if you've solved this issue and your physics hashes out the way you think it does and is in line with the sort of young earth creationist idea here, you you should reach out to their physicists because they've been trying to, they've been swinging at this problem for about two and a half decades. So if you've got the problem solved, reach out to them because my understanding is that they've they've kind of beat this horse to death and then back again. Um, but in the meantime, please, if you do feel comfortable, I would be absolutely fascinated to see your paper on this subject. So send it to Arden if you'd like. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm not interested in the publication is not on young earth creationism. It is no, on no, regardless, a, a simulation associated with regardless. relativity. But no, 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 I'm not. I, I, this is not my my interest in life. But, but I, I really appreciate your uh I just I just wanted to let you know that there was a solution uh, to your thermodynamics issues that's not extreme. Well, thank you, Tom. I'm not convinced. I don't think our resident physicist here is convinced either. But that being said, we appreciate your time as well. And let's let you go. Uh, time is gone. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, okay. I want to see the paper, don't you, Aaron? I that was kind of like a little a little cherry on top at the I'll, end that I felt was mentioned too I late. I think I need to print it off, and I needed to print that off, and like you say, literally attach it to the my copy of Gravitation <laughs> by uh, Meister <laughs> and Thorne. Uh, this is this book is gargantuan, but it's also fifty years out of date. Uh, but it's basically all right for all the budding physicists. There is a interesting problem with general relativity. The equations are what we call wicked hard to solve. 
<laughs> so there's like very few exact solutions and everything else has to be done in simulations. Uh, this book probably captures up the vast majority of all of like the exact solutions to general relativity because it's it's kind of hidden in like the main field equation for general relativity that it's actually like a series of of not just matrices, but partial differential equation matrices. So you basically have to solve 16 differential equations at once to get an exact solution with general relativity. And uh, that's what makes most graduate students cry. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna make that's gonna make me cry honestly <laughs> yeah i i found that very interesting you know i mean i'm glad you said it and because you were voicing my opinion as well right like you know he comes on here and he's like hey you know i suggest if you guys are really this clueless about it take a look at these youtube videos and it's like we got a physicist right here you know and who who's told you know you why this doesn't work and you know even me from my perspective right like of of looking at this under the lens of young earth creationism like it's not even applicable it, because functionally his solution wouldn't work with with an existing you know in these two weird time frames so it doesn't work theoretically and it doesn't work in practice and so <laughs> we're kind of up a creek at that point aren't we <laughs> yeah though it if there were such a whether god or alien moving at those speeds at least it could have a, a theoretically uh experimental prediction that we could actually go and make uh so like the various different ways to try to detect if there are any advanced civilizations out there like detecting their radio waves and things like that one of the more recent proposals is if there's a metallic ship basically sipping through at a significant fraction of the speed of light the light reflected off that ship is going to show uh, something called relativistic beaming, where the light will kind of bounce off, but also kind of be directed. So if we can look for any of those sorts of beaming effects by those um, enterprises from other civilizations sipping around at, you know, 90% the speed of light, it's like, oh, oh, that would be amazing evidence for um, advanced species out there. Uh, if you're wondering, we haven't detected any of those yet. So, okay, so let me get this straight, right? So like, it doesn't work in practice. It doesn't work theoretically. And also we have predictions of what it would look like if it was happening and we don't see that either. So even, even taking him at his word that this is something that could in fact occur, we are not seeing that. Is that, is that a correct um, <laughs> summation there? Yeah, I, I think that is correct. And if you really want to get past the problem, I think the best solutions are with uh, blue police boxes and a uh, small black hole inside to run your TARDIS. That's that's I think what we'll need. Yeah, I I think you're just about right. You know, I I've noticed from from the perspective of like again, like I talk about this very specifically with regard to young earth creationism because that's the only group that really has a heat problem. To be perfectly honest, everybody else is kind of just like yeah. yeah, whatever. Like the Earth can be pretty old. It's it's chill. It's fine. And then in the last yeah. Thursday, I guess. But um, it, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's been, honestly, it's been yeah. fascinating to see them slowly like come around to this like over and over and over again. Like they've tried all of these different solutions to try to get rid of all of this heat. And the answer, as published by them themselves on the Answers Research Journal, which is not a legitimate science research journal because it doesn't have objective peer review or a broad range of peer reviewers, but still they're like, ah, yeah, like we got a lot of heat. <laughs> we got, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> it's probably going to be a supernatural yeah. solution. And at that point, those of us who, who aren't young earth creations can put our hands up and go, look, the second you're invoking a miracle into this, my hands are tied. This is no longer in the realm of something that is investigatable by science. We're done here, right? The 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 yeah. thin yeah. veil of scientific rigor that you guys have put over this idea is even more in tatters. It has been incinerated in the backyard. <laughs> like, yeah, it's easy. and and honestly, what uh, Time was doing in his talk, it seemed like uh, the uh, day age theory of uh, interpreting the Old Testament, but with more steps. <laughs> Right. Like, why, why, why do you need to invoke the, the, the relativity? If you're taking a day age perspective, uh, God did it. Like he did it this way. And, and it's physics just kind of broke. Cause that's kind of what they're suggesting yeah. anyways, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and that was and it's also one, kind though. of an issue. Like yeah. And it just also makes me think when you, when I read the Bible and I put it into the cosmic perspective, Genesis one upsets me because it has this one throwaway line and he made the stars also. Yeah. <laughs> You cannot just talk about the trillions of stars and galaxies across billions of light years and just goes, and those also. Them too, right? Like, and yeah. our, our beautifully, our wonderful, but quite average star, no? Is is the sun particularly unique in our stellar neighborhood? 
yes and no. So um, it has a few things that do make it a little bit unique and actually something that's been kind of a problem. So, yeah. um, so, so here's the, the, what became a problem, more of a like, technology problem. So uh, have you heard of the Kepler Space Telescope? Yes, I have. That I do know. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and just for the audience, the Kepler Space Telescope, it was this mission that was basically put a telescope in space to basically stare at one patch of the sky and watch for basically the stars to blink due to the effect of planets being uh, mm. eclipsing their sun when they're going around and basically looking for all those little winks in the starlight. Now, when they developed that telescope, they basically assumed that stars would have about as much fluctuation in their light as the sun does. And using mm. that as a model to say, okay, then, uh, if we make the telescope with these specs, we should expect to find this many Earth-like worlds uh, with uh, these specs. But we've now discovered that actually the sun is actually on average quiet in terms of these fluctuations compared to other stars. So the specs for this telescope weren't as capable as would need it to be to really find those worlds because the other worlds are just the, the other stars are too fluctuating in their light to get uh, noisy uh, uh, to get enough data without enough noise that we can actually see, oh, there's a planet. Oh, there's an Earth-like planet. So it's in upsetting so we, to those we when we found out, oh. We standardized it to our sun, when in reality, like our sun is like a bit of an outlier with regard to this, and we should have considered a, a broader range of variability there. Yeah, and honestly, it would have been hard to do so because, oh. as you can imagine, it is very easy to observe the sun. It's nice and close. Uh, it's, it's, right. it's taken like another like 10 years of surveys to say enough to say, okay, in this way, the sun seems to be a little bit quieter than average. And why that is, is of course going to be an interesting astrophysics question for, so all the young uh, scientists in the audience who want to go into astrophysics, that's one of the mysteries to solve right now. Why is the sun so quiet? Listen, we love a good PhD uh, question. So, you know, get get to it. It's sometimes some people have the opposite problem where they're, they're like interested in too much stuff. Narrow it down, find your question. Some of you guys go out there are, are budding astrophysicists and solve this. I, I didn't know I was invested, but now here I sit invested. <laughs> I want to know what's weird about the sun or rather, why is it? Why is it so strange? Sweet. All right, Arden, I think we're ready. Let's let's do another one. All right. Uh, and before we get to the next caller, I want to say maybe if we are needing to perhaps mute a caller who has a sort of co-host syndrome, so to speak, you know, just <laughs> theoretically, uh, maybe there can be like a thumbs up thing you can give me and then I'll I'll know you want me to mute. So that way we can get a word in edgewise. Uh, All right. That's what I'm we'll do. Uh, we'll do one of these. Yeah. 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 I'll uh, try to keep my eye out. OK, so the next callers on the list are Sam from Georgia wants to know if evolution's is all from one common ancestor. How did speciation occur? Then we've got Jace, New Mexico, wants to know, is the cosmic egg a dangerous concept? Uh, hmm. We've got Dak in California who asks, are humans better than any creator as humans can talk to their creations, such as artificial intelligence? And lastly, Sid in DC who says genetic entropy just proves Darwinian evolution. Oh man. I mean, so, so my, my desire is obviously going to like, I hear genetic entropy. That's like a classic young earth creationist buzzword, but that that's going to be like, that's going to be like a whole thing. Like, I know that's going to be a whole thing. I, I feel like we should go in order. Right. So like our, our friend sure. Sid, right. Wants to talk about last common ancestor. Does everything share? Or are you cool with that one, Aaron? Cause I feel like Sid's been waiting. Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, okay cool. Right, oh, guess. sorry. I meant maybe this should be our mute the caller because <laughs> I, okay. I do thumbs up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Okay, we've got Sid in DC. Uh, Sid, you are live. Hello. 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 We hear you, Sid. Hi. How are you doing, Sid? Oh, we're doing well. How are you? I'm doing all right. I can't complain. Cool. All right. What's your question? What do you got? Uh, well, I want to see what your thoughts were on uh, on genetic entropy. Okay, genetic entropy. I thought okay, that's good by me. Let's let's get started. I actually thought this was a different caller, but genetic entropy. I'm always happy to talk about. So you're talking about John Sanford's genetic entropy, right? Mm hmm. Okay. So for those of you yeah, in the audience who may not know. Do you what? want to summarize this, or would you like me to? Either way is fine. I can go ahead. 
So genetic entropy is an idea that was put forward by John Sanford, a uh, young earth creationist genetics guy. He's the inventor of the gene gun, which he, he likes to bring up quite a bit. And it is a good invention, but genetic entropy, as I'll explain in a moment, has some issues that I think have been fairly well fleshed out. So genetic entropy is this idea that given the mutation rate of given species, right, we're going to accumulate too many mutations too quickly that are nearly neutral. So mutations that don't necessarily immediately harm an organism, but if they accumulate enough of these mutations, um, it will initiate a sort of error catastrophe is the general biological term for it, where the species is, is effectively doomed. So genetic entropy is like a ticking clock in the genome of, of every organism. And Sanford and other younger creationists um, such as uh, some of the actually younger creationists here on YouTube, but mm -hmm. Rob Carter is another one who subscribes to it, suggests that this is something that was initiated after the fall of man. Would you say that's a fair summary there, Sid? Yes, that sounds pretty correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'll take lead on this if that's okay, Aaron, because I have thoughts on genetic entropy. My biggest issue with genetic entropy is that this is something, this is a concept that's supposed to like, debunk the idea of evolution because you've got this accumulation of a bunch of near neutral mutations. The first issue is that genetic entropy requires redefining the term fitness, what fitness actually is for an organism. Um, Sanford talks about this in, in some vagaries when he, in his book, um, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. But like, you can't, you can't talk about evolution, really, if you're using a completely different definition of fitness. Fitness is like a key concept in evolutionary theory, right? It's the, the, the reproductive success of an organism as measured by its offspring. Differential reproductive success is, of course, how mutations are actually selected upon in a given population, or one of the many reasons, or one of the many ways, excuse me, in which they're selected upon. So the first is that genetic entropy redefines fitness. The second reason why genetic entropy is problematic is even if we do um, sort of skirt the issue of fitness, we have watched generation after generation, thousands of generations of organisms in the lab, in both um, microscopic organisms like E. coli, um, even viruses like H1N1, and uh, larger scale organisms like mice, we don't see any degradation. We don't see genetic entropy in these organisms that we're watching. And so Sanford and sort of his acolytes pivot was, well, genetic entropy doesn't necessarily impact bacteria and viruses and smaller organisms in the same way that it does humans. But the problem with that is that we have ancient DNA, ancient DNA that young earth creationists accept because they need the ancient DNA in order to, to link humans and Neanderthals as sort of this, this um, non-ape hominin kind, as it were. Um, but this ancient DNA also shows no degradation, right? So we can sequence the genome of humans and Neanderthals and Denisovans that lived 300,000 years ago plus we do not see degradation when we compare those ancient genomes to the genomes of today. So even if we are looking at time in a truncated young earth creationism sense, or I guess I should say like a compressed young earth creationism sense, there is no genetic entropy there. And so that leaves me with the question, Sid, like if we don't see genetic entropy in any of those examples, what is left for genetic entropy? Well, I wasn't aware you're saying we have the genome of ancient uh, Neanderthals? Yeah, not just Neanderthals, but humans too. So members of our species, members of Neanderthalensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and members of Denisovans. So we've got you know, three species of hominin, humans included, going back 300,000 years, which even though young earth creationists wouldn't say that's 300,000 years ago, I think we could both agree, myself and Sanford, that it's certainly more in the past than what both of us would consider a thousand years ago, right? Whether they, how far they take it into the past, we would both agree that that's ancient mm -hmm. DNA. And we don't see entropy when we compare those ancient humans to the humans of today. Well, but I'm confused. So wouldn't the genome decay after thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of years? No, it depends on the condition. So Neanderthals and the humans and the Denisovans that we have, the DNA all comes from like Siberian areas or like, um, far Northern Europe. These are the places where um, these bones are like stashed away in caves and things of that nature. So they can actually resist decay a lot easier um, than like what you'll find in, in the heart of Africa or in Southeast Asia where genomes are going to decay a lot faster. Okay. Well, if I can take you like through the steps I've, I've you know, looked into it and seen, you know, maybe you can tell me why I'm making a, a mistake here or whatever. So yeah, sure. I was just Shoot. reading this paper on uh, this channel called Standing for Truth, 
And it's kind of, yeah. kind of like goes through the different steps of it or whatever. And it, oh, it, it starts off yeah. with that. Uh, there's like, I guess, 100 uh, new mutations every person every year. Is that is that correct? Um, roughly, yes. But again, we also have to discuss the difference between mutations in the somatic cells versus mutations in the germline. So the mutations that are actually going to be passed on to offspring. Yeah, he, he quotes uh, Michael Lynch. I guess he's like a renowned geneticist. Yeah, Michael Lynch he is a geneticist. He talks about there's, there's, there's 100 uh, de novo new generations per uh, child that's born. Yes, but is that in the germline or is that in the somatic cells? Well, if it's being passed on, it'd be in the germline. Right, but what it's saying, what that quote is saying, is that we have that many mutations in an individual, but they need to be in the germline in order to be passed on. Right, like I get mutations all the time all over my body, like everybody does. When you get mutations in your skin cells, that causes cancer. But if you can get mutations in the, in the germline, right, that is potentially going to be passed on to offspring. So, but I, I know Donnie, I know Standing for Truth, right? Like I, I know geneticists who have been on his channel, including population geneticists who have studied things like Haldane's dilemma to death and who have talked to acolytes of Sanford specifically, including Paul Douglas Price, who's worked with John Sanford. And like, the problem is, is that genetic entropy does not hold up. It doesn't hold up in the lab. It doesn't hold up when compared to ancient samples, like taking the human mutation rate. First of all, there's, there's the hominin slowdown mutation rate going on there. But second of all, like the, the mutations as they're being counted up, right? It's not an accurate representation of the actual amount of mutations that are impacting each individual. And furthermore, like the second something becomes non-neutral, it effectively becomes selectable. So we're, we're dealing with this idea of neutral theory versus um, positive selection or, or um, directional selection or stabilizing selection, whatever. And all of that is going on in the mix with genetic entropy combined with the fact that from the very start, genetic entropy is dead in the water because it has to redefine fitness. That's my personal biggest issue with it. Like outside of the mutation rates, outside of the, in the lab, it doesn't, it doesn't show. Outside of in ancient DNA, it doesn't show. It redefines fitness. So we aren't talking about a, a, a evolution anymore, right? Genetic entropy has set up a straw man to kick down because it's dealing with fitness that doesn't exist. Fitness is just an increase in reproductive success. So I, I understand that y'all have a different uh, definition of fitness than uh, you know people who advocate for genetic entropy. But the, the quote, the exact quote from Michael Lynch's quote. Thus, keeping in mind that some mutations in repetitive DNA likely go undetected owing to mapping difficulties in genome sequencing projects with a diplo genome of, six, of a size of 6 billion bases, an average newborn contains around 100 de novo mutations, end quote. Do you agree with that? Or? Yeah, I, do. I agree with that. I think that's fine. But I mean, if these mutations are neutral, they're not causing any problems. If they're detrimental, they're going to be selected out of the population. And if they're positive, they're going to be selected upon. The problem is, which are being selected and which are not is entirely dependent on your definition of fitness. So you see where we run into this problem again. Like we can't have this discussion unless we agree on a definition of fitness. And genetic entropy relies on changing the definition. And like the, the answer, like I've talked to yeah. Standing for Truth himself about this. His answer is just, well, I don't think that the definition that evolution uses is appropriate. And it's like, well, okay, but then you're not talking about evolution anymore. No, I've, I've right? seen like, you on a channel before. It's kind of funny that you're on here. Yeah, no, I know. But, like uh, I, I know, Donnie. I've, I've talked with Standing for Truth quite a bit. Aaron, do you have anything you want to mm -hmm. add here? Um. I do feel a little bit ignorant on one point, but it comes to my mind when we mention entropy like this in this context, because I also then think of entropy in terms of like information theory and the common claim from wow. creationists, especially younger creationists, that you can't generate new information. But if entropy is increasing, uh, the, the d directly measurable Shannon information is increasing in that sort of body. So I may not know enough of how they're defining information and entropy in this context, because I would say this looks to be in conflict with the other creationist claim. But I've also noticed that when I ask creationists, what is their definition of, of uh, information? It 
never gets to something I can actually compare with a actual mathematical definition that we use in like, say, computer science. Yeah, it's more of the definition of entropy, not in like information theory, but like as far as against physics that, you know, systems go from a ordered system to a more chaotic state. Kind of like a second uh, law of thermodynamics. Yes. And uh, actually, Shannon's information theory is based on the exact same equations that basically Shannon was like, hey, what the guys are doing in thermodynamics, uh, that's a good way for me to also define information in the binary system that he was putting together. So uh, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Yeah. But yeah, if I can ask, so I know we agree on the first point that there's 100 new mutations per person per, uh, you know, per verb. I guess the second point I'm getting hung up on is uh, there's another quote from Michael Lynch that says, quote, in summary, the vast majority of mutations are deleterious. This is one of the most well-established principles of evolutionary genetics supported by both molecular and quantitative genetic da uh, data, end quote. Do you yes. all agree with that? Well, so the majority of mutations are are deleterious in some senses, but like the way that we teach it, right, is that it's they're neutral. They don't do anything at all because of the redundant nature of DNA. So you're not going to experience like most mutations aren't going to do anything at all. If they do anything, they immediately move whatever population we're talking about into like a selectable field. Right. Like there, there's not going to be an accumulation of these near neutral mutations that are unselectable until error catastrophe takes place. But like, again, I have to stress this, none of this matters because we're changing the definition of fitness and therefore we're not talking about evolution anymore. Like, I, I, I'm sorry to keep like beating this point, but like I've said this to Donnie, I've said this to Sanford Drew, I've said this to Paul Price. You can't just change the definition of something and then argue with the concept like it's the original concept, right? Like logically that doesn't hold, it, it simply won't work. And so we have to either come up with a definition of fitness that we all agree on, or we're all going to come to the conclusion that fitness in evolutionary biology means one thing, fitness in genetic entropy means something else, and never the twain shall meet. Hmm. Uh, well, I, I think you're talking about like bacteria. Do you, like, I guess, take Lenski's experiment as like evidence of uh, you know, fitness? increasing over time? Well, so, so this is a great example, right? Like, and we could talk about Lenski. I think a simpler example has to do with antibiotics, right? So let's say you have a bacteria, sorry, I keep kicking my car here. So like, let's say we have a bacteria, right? And this bacteria um, infests humans in their liver, let's say. I don't even know if there are any bacterial liver infections, but let's say that there are, right? This bacteria is, is wiped out by a specific antibiotic, except some of these bacteria are born with a deleterious mutation, a mutation that knocks out, let's say, 10 base pairs that give it resistance to the antibiotic. So now it's an antibiotic resistant bacteria that has a smaller genome, an entropic genome, as Sanford might consider it, compared to the original bacteria. But that doesn't matter because the mutation improves the bacteria's fitness in the context of the antibiotic, right? So Sanford would say that this is genetic right. entropy at play. Right. It's experiencing a mutation that reduced the size of its genome. And in the original context, it's going to perform more poorly than the original bacteria. But the problem is that's not what evolution is about. That's not what fitness is. In the context that this bacteria is selected for, the one with the deleterious mutation, which is the context where the antibiotic is present, it way outproduces the original bacteria, which gets wiped out by the antibiotic. So do you see why it's important that we define our terms here? Because under one condition, this is like, it, and when exactly. I say one condition, I mean like science, big ass science in general, right? This is a normal mutation that improved the fitness of the bacteria, therefore it has evolved, right? Sanford would say that's genetic well, entropy. And that's, why, that's why when I say evolution, not, I you know, to define in terms of specifically talking about like Darwinian evolution, the idea of, you know, gaining genes in, in a genome and gaining functionality, gaining uh, total information in, in a sequence. Right. But what is information, Sid? Because this is our secondary problem with genetic entropy. We can't define what information is. Is information the ability to perform a specific task? 
Is it the size of the genome? If it's the size of the genome, humans are woefully outperformed by many singular single cellular organisms. We're outperformed by lungfish. So we have smaller genomes than a lot of different organisms out there. And if it's by function, then that's going to depend again on the context. But all of this to repackage it once again, back to our original point, we can't talk about evolution without having a common definition of fitness. The, 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 the party stops there. And like, you know, you pulled this from Standing for Truth's blog, so I have to pull it back to Standing for Truth here. I've posed this to him and asked him, like, like I've said, look, we can't have this conversation. You're not talking about evolution. And his answer is, well, the definition of fitness shouldn't be the definition of fitness, right? It's incomplete the way it is. It's not, um, it's not well-rounded enough. And it's like, well, you're going to have to take that up with every evolutionary biologist since Darwin, because the definition of fitness has not changed. Well, and, you know, I'll grant you, you know, fitness as being defined strictly as, you know, reproductive rate, what's, what's going to reproduce more. My problem is that how do we go from, you know, bacteria to men? How do we gain all those genes? If, like you're saying, anytime we see adaptive evolution going on, it's genes being broken or downregulated, deleted. Uh, I, I don't see how we, how we have that, you know, Darwinian evolution going on. So, so let me, let me present you with an example, right? Like, let's say I have um, a sentence, right? And my sentence says cat, 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 the letter cat or the word cat three times in a row. Now let's say that I have a mutation event that duplicates one of those cats. So now I have cat, 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 four times the, the word cat. Now let's say we have a point mutation. Let's say we have a handful of point mutations that change it from cat, 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 sat. So now we have a new word at the end by one single point mutation that's acted on a duplication. And now we have another mutation on that second word cat. And now we have the sad cat, cat, right? Like you, you can, or the sad cat sat. That's what I'm trying to say. This would be better if I had a, a whiteboard or something like that. But what I'm trying to say is that you can take a single code on right a, or like a triplet of dna code let's in our example this is cat duplicate it three more times so you have cat four times and then change a couple of letters and you can go from having the word cat three times to the sad cat sat and that contains significantly more information than the initial sentence which was just the word cat three times like all that all it takes to get new information in a genome is duplication events and point mutations and frame shifts, even deletions. And we've seen this in real time, Sid, right? So there's, there's a, a population of fish called ice fish. And in their blood, they have this protein that gives it the quality of antifreeze. This protein, this singular protein in the blood of these ice fish is completely de novo. It is a single duplication, and I believe it's a point mutation, on a previous protein that all other ice fish have. So it's two mutations in total that gave normal ice fish blood with the properties of antifreeze, which allows them to swim north, eat more food that's not uh, accessible to other types of fish, grow bigger, live longer, and reproduce more often. And then every single one of their descendants has that ice fish antifreeze mutation. That's all evolution is, is it's just adaptation by selecting on new variation introduced by mutation. And for genetic entropy to be true, right? Like you would have to first again, change the definition of fitness, right? But you would also have to say that once something becomes selectable, that it just isn't selectable. Like we don't see this in any experiment, not in bacteria, again, not in viruses, not in mice, not looking at ancient DNA. So genetic entropy fails in theory and it fails in practice in the lab and in the wild. Well, what, what, what's like the, uh, give me a number on like, what's the chance of a, a beneficial mutation like you're talking about with the ice fish, one in a million? I have no idea off the top of my head, but a better question to ask on top of that would be what is beneficial? And the answer to that is it's context specific. But genetic entropy doesn't pose that. Genetic entropy doesn't allow for fitness to be context specific. It necessarily says that a genome has to gain information for it to not be entropy. 
And then it doesn't define what information is. So it changes the definition of fitness and doesn't define information. These two things alone make the concept completely insalvageable. But again, even if we take well, genetic that, entropy at face value, it doesn't hold. Good. But, and that's why I'll, I'll give you that, you know, I'll go with your definition of fitness, and I'll even give you that, you know, once in a million there's a, a beneficial mutation. How does that that beneficial mutation want to get outweighed by the, you know, 99% of the time you're getting these slightly deleterious mutations that, you know, natural selection can't act on? Well, Is that where it comes in? Can. Yeah, well, first of all, that's where fitness comes in. But I, Standing for Truth has had this conversation with Dan, who's actually here in the chat, um, who did his thesis on the concept of, of error catastrophe. And I think it was H1N1, Dan, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and like, you're not taking neutral theory into account at all. Like, if you actually look at Sanford's experiments, these near neutral mutations, the second they're not near neutral anymore, they're selectable. But again, it still doesn't matter because we're changing the definition of fitness. Like we could sit here, Sid, and talk about all the, the minutia that's wrong with Sanford, John Sanford's um, hypothesis and idea of genetic entropy and what's wrong about it as perpetuated by Paul Price or Standing for Truth. But the problem is so, it's so central that you can't take it any further than you're redefining what fitness is. Like, and other people have gone down this rabbit hole, like people who are way more uh, appropriate than me, population geneticists, geneticists generally, folks who are evolutionary biologists who specifically study like genetic entropy style ideas. They've gone down this rabbit hole with Paul Price, with John Sanford, with Standing for Truth. They can almost never make it past the fact that we're redefining fitness, but when we get around it, there's the tacit admission that we're also redefining information and we're also not counting beneficial um, non-genetic entropy trends in things like bacteria or um, microscopic or excuse me, um, smaller organisms like mice. And we're also not taking into account ancient DNA. So genetic entropy doesn't work in the past, extrapolating it backwards. It doesn't work in the present with small organisms. Where is there left to go with this? These semi-neutral deleterious mutations that aren't acted on by selection, again, this violates neutral theory. And when confronted with this, the answer is kind of just, nah, -uh. And like, I don't know what to say to that. What is that? I've heard of near neutral theory, but you're saying neutral theory? Is that like the, the uh, consensus yeah, so, of so uh, that's genesis? Yeah, so it's it's all done by Kimura, which is actually where Sanford pulls his work from. But Sanford doesn't differentiate between simulated data for the purposes of an experiment and actual data that's been born out in a lab, right? Like he takes Kimura, and I kid you not, you can find mm -hmm. a conversation, believe it or not, I can't believe I'm saying this, on Standing for Truth's channel on this exact subject, right, where um, uh, my friend Zach Hancock is talking, who's a population geneticist, is talking to Paul Price about this, right? But we're, we're talking about Kimura's. Yeah, I, I, I saw the debate on that. <laughs> yeah, okay, so yeah, you know about this already then, Sid. Like, I'm not gonna be able to tell you anything new because there's nowhere to take it, right? Like, Kimura, who is Sanford's entire basis for all of genetic entropy, in his primary experiment that Sanford is pulling from, specifically excludes beneficial mutations. Like, specifically does so. So, like, where do you, again, like, where do you take this from here? So when you say, I find it's like a semantic thing. So when you say the majority of mutations are neutral, you mean neutral as in the, fact, as in the sense of natural selection can't act upon them? So I'm, saying that this, I'm saying that the second something is going to cause a detrimental fitness effect, it is acted upon by selection by definition. Unless you want to change the definition of fitness, which is what genetic entropy does. Well, Sid, I would, I would what I'm love to talk like about a this normal more, just, I, like words in a normal. Okay. I was going to say I would love to talk to you about this more because I actually love this topic, but I've been monopolizing like the call for the <laughs> past like 20 minutes, and we do have some other callers on the line, so I, I really want to thank you for this. If you want 
email me, gutsitgibbon at gmail.com, and we can organize a time to have a chat about this somewhere else, either by email or on my channel or elsewhere, because I, I do want to get to the bottom of this with you. Um, but unfortunately, I can't be here. Otherwise, we're going to go on for another 30 minutes. So thank you so much for calling. Um, and I hopefully you'll email me and I'll catch you later. Well, I'm on standing for Truth's channel sometimes, so I think I'll see you around on there. Yeah, maybe we'll catch each other there. That would be lovely. Yeah. All right, well, you all have a Thank good you, night. Sam. Thank you very much. God you bless too. you. too. Take care. Man, this, that's my fear with the genetic entropy stuff. Like, you, this, you can take that through every circle over and over and over again and never quit. So I'm sorry that was probably really boring for you. <laughs> There's, there's, if I had a bit more additional context, like, especially, uh, if this entropy has anything to do with the entropy that I have studied, that would be helpful. But like I say, I have noticed very often that creationists will say that new information can't be created, but they won't tell us what information is so we can actually go out and check because that never turns out well. <laughs> um, I also want to quickly note that, um, I before told you that I had a two hour ish limit. I just got emails that says that two hour limit is now turned to three. So I'm able to uh, hang out and uh, apparently entropy is growing for our conversations. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know. Yeah, I the problem is, is like, I can't shut up. And honestly, when when I'm given a topic like that, like, it's just, we've been beating this drum for so long, like, I'm sure you know, like, there are tropes in young earth creationism in creationism generally, that just pop up over and over and over again. And it doesn't matter how many times you you talk about them, they're still, they still pop up and you have to, you have to treat it every time. Like it's the first time you're having the conversation. But like knowing that Sid was present for that conversation with, with my buddy Zach, right? And my friend Dan Angel, like, it's like, I don't, I don't know that there's anywhere to go there, right? Like other than sitting down and being like, okay, like let's, let's brass tacks talk about what the problem is theoretically and in practice with genetic entropy and then taking it step by step. And that is not a 30 minute conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I would definitely agree with you that if there, if we don't even agree what the terms are, then yeah, conversation is pretty difficult. If we're going to argue, if circles have corners, it's like, okay, this isn't even worth the time anymore. <laughs> well, right. And like fitness is such a core concept in evolutionary biology. You like, you can't just change, you can't just change the definition yeah. and then pretend like you've debunked the concept. Like, it's like, okay, you know, it, you could do that with anything theoretically and it's, it makes yeah. it completely meaningful. Yeah. So. And like in the terms of like the history of science, I mean, it's like, that was the big innovation of Darwin, the, the fitness criteria rather than just the randomness, because you go back 2000 years, there's basically a creationism versus evolution debate already in like the Greco Roman period but they don't have the, the robust idea of natural selection. So you have like the atomists at the time that basically everything is just like random bouncing around to things. And so given infinite time and infinite space, eventually you get fully functional humans. But of course that's so improbable that it's like, yeah, then by comparison, creationism looks plausible. It's only until smart guy, Charlie D comes along and, you know, really helps solidify this uh, whole thing. So, you know, like I say, props to Chuck for getting this to work. Well, yeah. And I mean, he came up with, with the concept, one of his biggest sort of, um, what, what sort of bugged him was that he needed a mechanism. Right. And like, that was sadly being done in his lifetime with, with Mendel, right? Like inheritance oh, yeah. and this idea of genetics and genes and things like that. But it wasn't until well after Darwin and Mendel had both died that people were like, oh my God, like, here's our mechanism. Here's how information in one organism is actually passed on to its offspring. And then you've got this wonderful tapestry because selection now acts on these characteristics that have a mechanism to move vertically um, through lineages, right? And it's like wickedly cool. What I gotta know though, what what's your big bugaboo, right? Like what's your, I've heard this argument so many times, it's driving me crazy. Oops. Well, I think the thing that might bug me is that so much of the science for the age of the earth and things like that can just be denied with the statement, were you there? <laughs> and I at least have, I think, a comeback. Yes, I was. Prove me wrong. <laughs> like, if we're going to just, you like, know, declare. <laughs> well, and the, the were you there thing kills me because like the people who say that, right, it's from this, you can find in the same book, 
like the same answers, you know, uh, answers in Genesis answers book, right? Or uh, replacing Darwin with Nathaniel Jensen or genetic entropy in the mystery of the genome by John Sandberg, pick any of them. The same, the same guys will be like observation and then prediction and then a fulfilled prediction. This is the gold standard of science, right? This is the way that we know that an idea uh, holds a lot of water. And then not only will they ignore all of the validated prediction by evolutionary theory from its practice in agriculture to its practice in medicine, but they will completely ignore the fact that radiometric dating, which tells us the absolute ancient ages of, of the earth uh, from meteorites or from the Canadian shield, whatever, right? They'll ignore the fact that we use that to find oil and other fossil fuels that radiometric dating through basin modeling is literally the backbone of our energy industry as it functions right now, which means that every time you fill your car up, that's a fulfilled prediction of radiometric dating in the ancient age of the earth. And they'll be like, uh-uh, no, no, discordant dates. I can find a rock that, that gave a discordant date. And the worst part is when you go to look up that rock and see if it really was a discordant date, it wasn't a discordant date. It's always a brand new volcano that they're like, oh, this volcano erupted 50 years ago and a radiometric date doesn't say 50 years. And it's like, yeah, no, duh. It's like trying to weigh a truck on a microgram scale. You can't radiometrically date something that's under a thousand years old. That's yeah. crazy. You, you oh, carbon date. And I think it, it's actually even but... worse than that with uh, with volcanoes because I think often the rocks that come out from volcanoes also include, um, uh, what's the term, uh, xenoliths. They have like uh, other yeah. foreign material in there from old rocks. So it's like, yeah, if you look at the old part of the rock, yeah, it looks super old. And it's like, yeah, that's how you call, well, Let's see, the nice term is lying. Uh <laughs> yeah, well, right, exactly. Well, and it's like my question then was where they're like, oh, what about xenoliths? And it's like, so okay, how do you think we know what a xenolith is? Right? It's like because we have diagnostic criteria to diagnose xenoliths, so we know when we can radiometrically date a rock and when we can't, right? Like and, and they're always like, oh, you know, well, what if we speed up radioactive decay? It's like, man, do you have any idea how huge that would be for the energy industry if we could speed up radioactive decay? <laughs> like, you, it, no, it, it, it cannot be done. It also runs into conflict way. with another thing because do you argue that, like, the decay rates can change? The problem is, like, the decay rates of, like, uranium are basically fundamental to the atom itself and the constants of nature. So to change that, you have to change the constant of nature. And wait, what's this whole claim that the constant of nature are so stupendously fine-tuned for existence that is on a knife's edge? But apparently we can change it by a billion orders of magnitude on a whim just to make the numbers go in the right direction. Exactly. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then this is the this is the best part. Like I know the parts keep getting better, but it's like also, not only do the fundamental laws of physics have to change to speed up radioactive decay, but each decay chain has to change in stepwise, along with the rate of the continents, the, the, the rate at which coral and trees grow, the deposition of ice, and the speed of light. And all of these have to change speeds stepwise, sometimes in opposite directions, to give the illusion that the Earth is actually very young and just looks old. That's insane to me. That uh, There is absolutely no way that you can argue God is not being deceptive if that's what he's doing. It is the ultimate conspiracy theory. Like, literally all of yeah, nature is true. in on it. <laughs> like, all... The everything. rocks are out to get us. Absolutely the rocks are out to get us. It doesn't matter which, down to the gastroliths that you find in the bellies of dinosaurs, right? Like every aspect of science. Uh, and when I say this, I do mean like, I, I sat down with a friend of the channel, uh, a dapper dinosaur to try to come up with like, is there any field of science that doesn't debunk young earth creationism? And we came up with maybe optics, but only in like the non macroscopic sense, like, like Newtonian optics. Maybe. Hmm. There are a few deviations from Newtonian optics because of electromagnetic theory, but they're probably too small to notice. So, uh, so maybe? But, uh, <laughs> I was actually more thinking, well, like, when it comes to optics, but there's the whole, the eye thing not being perfectly evolved. So it's like, but that's a different optics question. Uh, it, it but on the other hand, no, I mean, dentistry goes against creationism. <laughs> Well, I, I wear glasses. I mean, oh, but, oh, sorry. Actually, I got to clue you in on this one. That's actually genetic entropy. The fact that we have to go to the dentist and wear glasses is genetic entropy, but it's only at play in humans, mind you. 
not anything else. And also it's not been at play from 300,000 years ago to 12,000 years ago, just from 12K to now. So keep that in mind, folks, when you're considering all of this. Anyways, okay, so there's only been genetic entropy. Oh, okay, okay. So what are our options right now? Uh, so I just sent y'all in our group chat a screenshot of the remaining call list. Uh, to the callers on the line who can hopefully hear me right now, uh, we're hopefully going to get through all of you, especially since uh, Aaron's schedule just opened up a little bit for us. Uh, mm. We're going to try and hit awesome. all of the three left, but I did close the line so no new callers will come in. But if you're waiting on the line right now, hold on. We're hopefully going to get to you. Wonderful. Right. So um, what I'm sounds good to you? Options. What do you want to do so I'm looking at two things. One, it looks like all the people on the line are atheists. So uh, that's not a good selection criteria. Uh, I will note one person has been waiting about twice as long as the others. So I think uh, giving it to Sam might be the most uh, uh, sure. egalitarian. All right, Sam in Georgia, uh, you are live on the line. How's it going, guys? It's going, how are you? doing just fine so I, I assume you guys can see the uh the topic yeah tell us a little bit more about that so you know how uh <laughs> you know kent hoven he's always talking about dogs don't produce cats or whatever the hell so the obvious <laughs> comeback to that is well duh they don't you can't species can't make other species but the thing is is like well it all started somewhere right we all had one common ancestor so I'm wondering how that all works, because eventually they do make different species. Mm, okay. Aaron, I always take, I always get to go first. So you want to go first? All right. So I think uh, so the, the Kent Hoven straw man is the idea of a current species evolving into another current species. That is the sort of thing that doesn't right. work. But if you run things back in time and you look at two disparate species, cats and dogs, because we got to go, go with our pets, you go back further and further in time and their ancestors look more and more and more similar until you get back to something that's basically, hey, it's the same guy. It's that common ancestor. So, and, and my um, physics understanding of this, which means the absolutely correct one, because physics explains everything. <laughs> Erica, of mm -hmm. course, please... Uh, you know, slap me up for saying such a terrible thing, but no, nonetheless, no, I, the basic idea. Yeah. <laughs> but the basic no, idea no, is no. you have you have a population of reasonably similar creatures. There is some diversification with them, in particular, if they are separating out, they go to different populations. A trait that becomes fixed in one population is not in the other one, and those small differences accumulate with time because they are not destined to that particular end, they will diversify, but not to a particular point. So it is not that the common ancestor of cats and dogs basically decided at one point, one was gonna go in the cat direction, one was gonna go in the do dog direction. And never will it be the case that current dogs will be ever pushed to become cats or vice versa. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I so my, my- um, I wasn't trying to make it sound like there was a goal in mind or anything. Hmm. Uh, I, so, I like, definitely understand my, you were saying that. I keep interrupting. I'm sorry. I keep getting I keep getting ahead of myself and interrupting. You guys keep going. <laughs> All right. I'll just quickly I say that um, I, I, yeah, I, that I understood that you weren't trying to do that, but I was trying to squash the creationist straw man because that is the thing in the environment that needs to be continuously um, ground down and pushed away so it stops infecting um, our education system. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. So I do want to add something to this is like, here's my, um, here's my whatever, uh, what do you, would you call it? Like a, like a black pill take, like my, I, that's like a far right thing though. I, I mean, here's my insano style take. Species are, in my opinion, not biological realities, right? So we're, we're talking about populations of organisms that descend um, and exist in an ancestor descendant relationship, right? So you have a population of dogs and a population of bears today. And if you trace their ancestry back in time, eventually you're gonna run into something that that is effectively, it's not an amphicionid like a dog bear, but it's going to be something that's relatively sim similar, right? Like a basal carnivore. And, um, and like you take that guy further back in time with any given primate and eventually you're gonna converge and like approximately 
60 odd million years ago, now more like 70 million years ago, I think these days on, on some kind of mammal, right? And you take that mammal and any given dinosaur and take it back far enough in time, and you're eventually going to converge on some kind of tetrapod, like a, like a tectalic type, take that guy and any mollusk, go far back in time, and eventually you're going to converge on, on the last universal common ancestor, or in this case, last universal common eukaryote, and so on and so forth until you get to LUCA, right? We assign species to organisms because it is convenient for us to do so. But there is no legitimate definition for species that can adequately separate out organisms in the past and in the present. Uh, and even in the present, it's difficult. Like a lot of people, Kent Hovind in particular, like the biological species concept. If two things can interbreed and produce viable offspring, then they are the same species. But the problem is, right, like a donkey and a horse are different species. Nobody's gonna tell you that they're the same species they sometimes produce viable offspring. It's rare, but it happens. Or an American paddlefish and a Russian sturgeon, two fish that have been separated for 240 plus million years on different continents and genetically, right? They can still reproduce and, and make viable offspring, and yet a dog and a cat can't. And the reason for this is because genetics doesn't work on clear lines um, in a sort of speciation sense that we understand it, right? we impose speciation, a static concept, onto like ancestor descendant relationships, which is a dynamic concept, right? Organisms change through time in such a way that if you had every single species that ever existed, all of them on a giant, you know, uh, uh, screen, so you could see them all, and you, they were organized in a way that like, the, you know, things that are most similar to one another by population, you would not be able to draw a clear line that is standardizable between one species and the next at any point on that map. It would be like trying to point out where red, red starts on a color gradient. This is one of the best supports for evolution out there. The fact that there aren't clear lines between species shows us that speciation is a slow, sometimes slow, sometimes fast, sometimes clear cut, sometimes messy process that is incomplete in many species that are in the process of speciating all over the world, like species and salamanders. Um, and that's the beauty of it, right? Is that it occurs so, so dynamically and so differently depending on the lineages or the populations that you're looking at. And that is not how it should look if creationism is legit. Because God creates these static groups of things that are clearly not related in any way to one another. We don't see that. We don't find a clear de delineation genetically today. We don't find one morphologically looking into the past. There just isn't one. Life blends from, from one population to the next, from one species to the next. And it only seems clear cut today because we're looking at a horizontal slice. Um, so that's my, my idea on, on species. I like the concept, but that's, it's, not, it's useful, but it, I don't think it's a biological reality. I'm actually a little surprised okay. you didn't also mention ring species. Yeah, ring species is, yeah, ring species classic, right? I mean, these are, are groups of organisms that are adjacent to one another and adjacent populations can interbreed and they're clearly traced back to a parent, but farther away populations cannot anymore. They've, so some have experienced reproductive isolation and others have not. All righty. Yeah, I guess, like the, I guess the main gripe I had at first was just the terminology that was being used. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, things do change. I mean, this is undeniable. People who don't think so or just they're not looking or they're purposely deceiving themselves. So, yeah, it's, a, it's all just a time frame thing. Exactly. Populations of organisms can be definitively traced back in time, right? Um, especially when ADNA, ancient DNA comes into the mix. Um, but you get nested hierarchies even when you plot out organisms today. And species are super useful uh, to us as humans when we're trying to talk about about organisms, but like they're messy too. They're they're really yeah. messy, as we should expect if organisms are all related and speciating at different rates depending on the location and the selective pressure. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> so sorry, right, that, that might I, be. Uh... I, I, I've got a passionate feeling about species. I I, I like to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got gotcha. you. So basically, a yeah, species is just a nice little box like to put things in, but of course, it's not that clean. It's a messier, blurred, la blurred line. 
Yeah, I, again, like the way I like to think of it is it's a static idea applied to a dynamic concept or process. Mm. Okay. That makes sense. Perfect. Cool. All righty, guys. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, no problem. Have a good night. Have a good one. All right, sweet. I'm I'm psyched. I was just I was like I was getting so caught up in it there. I I that's a subject that actually <laughs> I have a stark disagreement about with my advisor who's very much like a species mm. realist and um I I just I don't I don't buy it. I'm I'm enlightened by <laughs> by species being an arbitrary concept. <laughs> At the very least, the the very basic definition I remember learning of species, you know, taking like, you know, one on one biology is two groups of populations that can't interbreed. It's like, well, how does that work with uh, bacteria that asexually reproduce? It's like, OK, already I see a problem with even my smooth biology brain here that doesn't know the details. It's like I already found a big counterexample. And by big, I mean, what, 99 percent of all biomass? <laughs> Like, like so many organisms, right? In the grand scheme of things, we're just dwarfed by these guys and they completely balk at our idea of species. You know, like you're, you're completely right. And these, these organisms, they don't care about the definitions that we want to apply to them. Our convenience means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we uh, ready to do the yeah. next call? Yes. And I believe the uh, choice is yours. The choice is mine. Okay, let me let me choose. You know, let's just go in order. Um, I think next right. was uh, Jace. He, they, atheist. Is the cosmic egg a dangerous concept? Jace, you are alive. Hello. Jace, Hello? are you there? Welcome aboard. Hello. Hi, how are you? Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm doing really good. Um... I uh, I first just want to say that I heavily identify with uh, like uh, before the last call you were talking about how whenever we put gas in our car, it's because something was radiometrically dated. And most of my family works in the pipeline industry and cool. play and is also creationist to some degree. And oh I think it's goodness. just really strange that their entire line of work that they do to make money is based upon the earth being incredibly old. So <laughs> I think it's very <laughs> I, ironic. I sympathize. Like lest we again talk about, I, I brought it up on this channel or like being on Skeptalk before, but like, have you heard of a uh, Zion oil, Jace? I, I think I have. I think I, I it sounds familiar. It's a, it was an oil agency, right? An oil drilling agent. I don't know what you, uh, what you would call them, an oil company, right? And they wanted to do oil drilling without radiometric dating. Um, you should go and see what their stock is worth <laughs> right now because they're not doing so hot, oh, probably right? Pennies. Um, yeah, pennies, pennies. I actually know a couple of people who have bought stock just because it's a, like a novelty, right? But like, yeah, radiometric dating is absolutely critical to, to the energy industry. And this isn't just me saying it, right? Like, this isn't a conceptual thing. Like, I've got geology friends who are students and who are, are bona fide graduated, like, petroleum geologists. And I've got sources, like, in a in a big document somewhere. Some, I've got it in, like, a megadoc, right? That's like, hey, here's, here's where you can find in the literature spanning from decades ago to as recently as, like, two or three years ago, talking about... The, the pivotal role that radiometric play radiometric dating plays in um in finding fossil fuels like it's absolutely critical because otherwise think of how much money you waste just drilling in random spots like how else would you decide where to where to shoot down a, a big oil rod or however they do it <laughs> i think they used to do it with dowsing rods back in the dowsing day rods. There it is. exactly <laughs> so tell us about your cosmic egg let's hear about it uh, it's, uh, it's been a thing. I've been watching a lot of episodes of the line recently, like back, mm. back episodes and whatnot, patching up and I'm seeing it more and more now. Uh, I, I've really clued into it because it has three basic, like three basic beliefs, three, like three basic steps. And then my, like my red flags start going off. It's when people mm. say that we are all gods. Then they limit it down to, but we are all actually 
one God, uh, and then this God okay. is like an infant God, an egg of a God, like essentially. Um, and I think that it's a very dangerous belief because another one of the core tenets is that this God is living through every conceivable human lifetime. And it's why, it's why reincarnation seems like a thing and past lives seem like a thing. So they, right. so they say, and, hmm. uh, and once this God lives through all possible human lives, then it will ascend to actual, to actual Godhood. Right. So, uh, like, and once you die, you will become part of the, like, of the God consciousness or whatever, right? And it doesn't matter that, like, you die, maybe it still has to live 10,000 lives after that or whatever, but to you, it would be a blink. And then all of a sudden, you're this God. And it does not preclude finding a, um, I, I, trying to say this in a way that you can still remain monetized, but uh, trying to find a uh, ultimate solution to finite problems. If you, I see. if you catch my drift. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so the, the, the concept that I you're think talking it's about, very, very dangerous. I think this started as a short story, believe it or not. And then Kurt's Gazette, you know, the little bird animation channel that does like a, like, what if we, what if we launched a bazillion I'm nuclear familiar. warheads at the moon or something? Right? Like, I'm pretty sure they did a video about that. So that might be why it's gaining popularity. But to my understanding, like it, it was more of just like a thought experiment, right? Like sort of a way to be like, oh, treat others how you would want to be treated because you're literally everyone, right? But like, I mean, right. you do, you do make a point that like if if the idea is that we are all each other, and once you've lived every life, then you can ascend to godhood. Then like, you know, you you would be you could see a concern there, an ethical concern on like expediting that kind of process. Right. I see um, what you're saying. What do you think about that, Aaron? Like, and I've had I've had people um, like. Uh, uh, die by their own hand, uh, mm. at least like two in my life, uh, very dear friends to me. And, uh, like, I don't know if it was from this. I doubt it was in one case at least, but, uh, but I don't know. And a lot of like quantum mysticism, hippie woo sort mm. of things get mixed in with it. All kinds of like sacred geometry and like, and yeah, this, that, and the other, um, I, I work in Renaissance festival circles and stuff. So like, so there's a lot of woo out there, yeah. but, yeah. um, but yeah, like it just seems to be a very easy vector for somebody in, uh, like in this country, at least to have like a real, like vibes based religion and like, and talk about energy and, right. and stuff and not know what they're talking about. Uh, it just seems v really easy and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, well, so back when Dr. Adair was on with Godless Engineer, I th there was a guy oh, that, uh, he was very, very um, arrogant and uh, and he got like basically laughed off the show uh, in <laughs> rather quick summation. But uh, but a lot of the things that he was saying were, were ringing my alarm bells with, with this cosmic egg stuff. Well, what do you think, Aaron? Let's let's hear your perspective on this because I've kind of given my I, I I thought it was a short story, but you go. Yeah, I, I remember it also as a short story, and yeah, I think it was also repro reproduced on Kurzgesagt. Uh, yeah, I'll have to see if they also have it on their German channel as well. I I try to watch the German one as well to mock uh, mm. mine a Deutsche Beste uh, Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll stick with English for now, so I don't embarrass myself too much. Uh, but. Um, in many ways, I mean, the message of it is honestly less than harmless in that it's basically a way of trying to think of how we're all interconnected in a way that's not true, but in a way of if you imagine yourself not just knowing another person, but actually truly are them and how you would want to treat that person thinking that this is how you're treating yourself, that can at least be 
inspiring to better behavior, but you're also right to actually believe that probably requires loading on all the quantum woo and other things. And so, yeah, it to actually believe that rather than just treat it as a short story would require metaphysical problems, to put it mildly. Well, and like you want to take this from a yeah, perspective uh, of like, okay, should we actually take it seriously? Like, is this something that that can actually that's actually making any statements? And like to me, this seems I correct me if I'm wrong here, but like it's completely un, infalsifiable, right? Like we can't we can't do anything to really interact with this concept, right? Or or test it or um, put it up to scrutiny. It's kind of just like you said, Jace. It's completely vibes based. And, you know, I, I would love it if we could yeah. just say, OK, like it's a vibes based thing. Take take the good out of that and and kind of leave it. But like, I think the responsible thing is to do kind of what you're doing, right, is to appreciate that, like, there are ways that this could be taken in a negative direction. Um, and we need to be aware of that. And like when when people come at you with the cosmic egg, right, as an idea, probe a little bit deeper on that and see like, OK, like, well, first of all, like, why do you why do you feel that this is a religion that you want to take instead of like a inspiring short story, first of all. Uh, but second of all, what are the implications? Right. Yeah. And if, and if also when it comes to short stories, we also can add more to the collection. Uh, it wasn't quite a short story. It was a more novel length. It's called um, Star Maker. And it's an mm -hmm. early bit of science fiction from the 1930s by Olaf Patterson. Was that the name? Uh, but basically the creator God is basically like the, almost like the demiurge of Plato and creates all the worlds, creates heavens and hells, creates worlds with multiple Jesuses and things like that, multiple layers of hell, uh, and all these, you know, great, uh, collections and trying to just, you know, imagine this almost like cosmic experience of meeting this creator beyond the creator, uh, sort of entity. And also it pissed off some Christians like, uh, C.S. Lewis himself said this was like, uh, like uh, pure paganism and absolutely hated the book. <laughs> so all the more reason to read it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I think uh, Jordan Peterson also like had an updated list of rules or whatever for your life. Oh. And one of them was uh, to treat yourself as though you were someone that you were responsible for helping or whatever. So it, it almost goes to that idea, but not quite. Um, like, I, well, like, how I think so that basically, I might be reading to too much it. into it or anything, but. I think this also contradicts one of his other things about like, you know, speaking uh, clearly. And it's basically, he just made a convoluted version of the golden rule. So it's like, yeah, okay, that's what once I again, that's very Jordan Peterson of him. Yeah, like uh, Jordan Peterson is Jordan Peterson is anything if not contradictory to anything that he says. So, well, as the as the cosmic apparently chaos he's running a scam room. college now. Oh, really? Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, like I think it, so. you have to reinvent the wheel, right? Like, be kind to other people. You don't have to literally be them for there to be a good reason to treat others with kindness. Like, it doesn't. In fact, like there's there's almost something, at least brutally speaking, right, more altruistic about the fact that like this is somebody else who isn't you. You should be kind to them regardless, no matter if they're going to to benefit you and your and your trundle towards godhood, right? <laughs> like, you just be kind to other people. It's Right. It's, it's a golden rule. Like, well, that'll give me brownie points in the afterlife thing. because I will have been yeah. good to myself. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Just like be I good would to better other say that I. Good to other people. Yeah. And the reason I like to be good to other people is because I want to be the sort of person who is actually generally good. I don't want to lay in bed and light and think to myself, man, I just am a con artist to everyone. I don't want to be that kind of person. <laughs> well, other animals have. I'm like, an very asshole. <laughs> Right? Like, you don't, a, a chimpanzee has a basic moral system. It has proto morality, or, you know, as we would call it, which, like, it, maybe it's a bit more simplistic than what we would consider, like, the, the inner machinations of, like, human society. But as far as, like, the basic rules, like, chimps followed some, some pretty pro moral societies. It's like, do they, do they have to have somebody to tell them to do that? Right? Like, do, is mora does morality need to be um, struck into them by, by the fear of punishment? It's like, no, not necessarily, right? Like sometimes they truly do behave in genuinely altruistic ways in ways that we can't seem to comprehend, like why they do the things that they do, not just not just chimps, right? But other primates, other apes, elephants, cetaceans, right? Like corvids, it's 
altruism is kind of rampant in the animal kingdom and they don't require a belief system to, to institute it. So, I mean, I think that says something about like our better nature, the fact that like humans are capable of great good and we don't have to be threatened to do that good. If that yeah, makes sense. I've had uh, actually personal experience with elephants and they are very emotional creatures. Like I was, uh, I was caring for a, like a sisterhood of three elephants oh, and the main that's one that's went that's to go take pictures for a Renaissance festival. And we were awoken by the angry and frustrated trumpeting of the other two <laughs> because <laughs> their, their sister had gone and was gone and for a long time. <laughs> well, it's, there you can like, read, you can read. They, the they like have emotions. They have experienced sadness. sadness. They, they, uh, uh, they, they mourn they, their dead. They, they bury their dead. They, <laughs> They do all of these very, like, quote unquote, human things. Well, and, you know, other other apes, if you read the books of like Franz Duvall or anybody who, who works with like bonobos or, or chimpanzees or orangs or gorillas, like you read some really interesting accounts, especially of, of captive, captive individuals, simply because we can watch them all the time of like apes that will just risk life and limb to help another member of their group at zero benefit to themselves, right? Like a low ranking female, uh, I can't remember her name, uh, that friends of all accounts in a chimpanzee colony, I think it was the Yerk station. Um, one of the other chimpanzees was shocked by an electric fence and like fell into the water and chips cannot swim, right? So, so this female chip who's a lower rank, like goes into the water knowing she can't swim, but risking it because she wants to help this this other chimp in, in her group who you know ostensibly like there there's nothing to gain for her there but she does it anyways right like that's that echoes a lot of human behaviors like i don't see how that's like strikingly different than the the ideas of altruism that we humans ascribe to ourselves so like I, there's great morality and great complexity in in the societies of other organisms and we do them a great disservice when we put ourselves on a pedestal and i think we do ourselves a great disservice as well uh, because that unity is beautiful i think Uh, they have like these animals they have systems of fairness if you give one a really oh, yeah. good treat and give one a really crummy treat then the one with the crummy treat wants the the better treat like it's and then that well, like also uh Vengeance comes into my question it. about souls like what has a soul then do they have souls because they also have emotions and bury their dead and mourn their dead and do all these like humanish type things like so where does it stop? Like, do dolphins have souls? Do like do elephants have souls? Do does the grass have a soul? Does that tree over there have a soul? Like, where does it end? Like, how, no, how you're also touching feeling into or a, whatever does it have to be? You're also touching into another subject area because, um, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, book that I recently co-authored with Jonathan M. S. Pierce on aliens and religion, the issue then of course comes up with how does this work with uh, other intelligent species, are they insold or not? And then what are the theological problems that basically, uh, you know, how does this work with the Jesus story in particular? Does he also need to make a trip over to Alpha Centauri and Omicron Percy I-8 and get himself sacrificed over and over and over again? And then you got a slug Jesus who is salted for your sins and all sorts of uh, oh, uh, uh, <laughs> terrible- uh, Vampire uh, Jesus for that is staked for your sins. <laughs> Well, mm, so what's mm. neat, what's neat about this as, as our resident um, delver into the inner machinations of young earth creationism is what's really strange is like their, their response to this UAP stuff that we were talking about earlier, Aaron, is like, well, aliens, don't you know, they're just demons. demons. Yeah, they're demons <laughs> that, that will abduct you. And like, why demons are they abducting the you? By Satan. I don't know. Like, what are they, what, why are the demons abducting people? Why, why do they... <laughs> Why do they mutilate cattle and make crop circles? And like, it's just, it's really interesting because it feels like they're almost future proofing themselves. Like, because they like the, the young with creations, a lot of the creationists in general of, of all stripes are like, okay, like what if we do find microbial life on Mars, right? Like what's that going to do? What would that say about the fine tuning argument, for example? Um, if life is, is you find it twice in our solar system, that has a lot to, mm -hmm. I think that has a lot of bearing on how common life you could project that outwards because your, your sample oh, size yeah, has just yeah. doubled in two planets oh, right in next particular, to you. 
Oh, in particular, I could just imagine if we drilled into the ice uh, and the water below the icy surface of Enceladus um, or Europa, and we find, you know, you know just put a camera down yeah, yeah. there. And, yeah, yeah. If we sent a camera down into Europa, started looking around, and all of a sudden a fish came and licked the camera lens. Oh my goodness, so much of biology would just be uh, in a tussle and to realize, yeah, twice in extremely different environments, life emerged. It's like, okay, the life goes from, eh, there might be some other intelligent species in the galaxy to, holy crap, we must be surrounded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you've got some really interesting uh, solutions to the Fermi paradox that you've got to address. Because <laughs> you're like, oh my God, uh, like, where's that great filter? Um, because what if we yeah, haven't uh, hit that great wall yet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, Jason, thank you so much for calling. Um, this has been a lovely conversation. We do still have one more person waiting on the line and I don't want them to wait for too long. So thank you so much for this. This was a great pleasure. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, and do call back again if you ever want to discuss. I'd love to hear more about your elephant experiences. Yeah, it's uh, it was it was really crazy. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking my call. Uh, one one final quick thing. My fa uh, my least favorite thing is, uh, and I've had it from a member of my family, is if we came from monkeys, then why are they still monkeys? <laughs> I I have had a grown adult ask me that question, and I I oh, die inside a little every time that it happens. <laughs> Yeah, I, so I'm sorry. So it's, a rite of passage. it's a rite of passage of having these kinds of conversation with people that you have to have that conversation and look at the trees. That's another one. Just look at the trees. They're so complex. <laughs> Thank wager. you again, Jason. Take care. Voice goes back to. Oh, my bad. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. I totally, there was a delay there, Jason. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. <laughs> I Call in we were... studio is weird like that. I try to anticipate people and hit the drop button ahead of time to make yeah. it smooth. But then sometimes somebody like is like, oh, wait, last brain I... moment. You know, it's all right. I mean, and Jace is right. Like Pascal's wager. That's another great example. So thank you for the call, oh, Jace. Yeah. And um, yeah, let's let's hit this last one, shall we? All right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Dak in California. Oh, yeah. Hi. You are live. Hi, Dak. How are you? Oh, I'm doing all right. That that was a perfect segue, actually, into my topic. It wasn't really meant so much as a question as a topic of conversation, but that was a perfect segue into it because, I mean, think about it. Uh, if artificial intelligences were created by humans, why are there still humans? Hey, Doc, <laughs> before we go on with this conversation, can I ask if you are using, like, a, a headset or something to move the mic slightly away from your face? Because our audio levels are... I don't know. It's, it's a telephone, but I'll try to adjust it. Yeah, I, uh, the call screener um, mentioned that as well. I got to be kind of careful how I hold my phone, apparently. Yeah. Um, must not have a real well, great uh, microphone. <laughs> right. I, I understand, Is that better? But totally. um, speak again. What's that? It, I'm still there a little bit, Dak. I yeah. still hear that crackling. It's all right. You, it, just go on. It'll oh, be fine. Yeah, no okay. Oh, well, that's I better. don't know Whatever what would be doing that. No, now well, it's I switched better, to the other side. Maybe that'll make a difference. Now it's back again. That's okay. Um, okay, so you want to talk yeah. about artificial intelligence. This one is this one's going to be an Aaron one for sure. You know AI more oh, than I do, or at least I hope so. <laughs> Well, no, that's all right. That's all right. Here's here's the thing. I mean, okay, you know, you know, biological evolution way better than I do, um, and, and yet I know evolution itself better than any biologist I know because my my knowledge and understanding of evolution is mostly non biological evolution. Um, you know, so so we're all going to have our, our you know our strengths and our and strengths and our weaknesses. Of course, there was uh, while I was waiting, there were some people in the live chat. I didn't catch the whole thing, but they were talking something about rolling dice, and somebody made a comment that um, you know if you roll two six sided dice um, 144 times, you know that, that 12 of those times, on average, 12 of those times are going to come up double sixes. That's not true. It would be approximately four of those times on the average, not 12 of those times on the average, because you got 36 different ways the dice can roll. And so, yeah, these things just roll off my head. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, when it comes to my, what, I was, what I was meaning to say about the artificial intelligence is that, uh, you know, we humans designed them 
Not all of them are conversational yet, but those that are conversational, we are having conversations with them. They don't have to uh, take it on faith that their creator exists. Well, what do you think? Ar- Arn, you take this one off. I just called you Aaron. I'm used to calling Aaron, Aaron. Aaron, you take this one. <laughs> uh, let's just say, if you put Aaron and next, me next to each other, we are, we're totally identical. You couldn't possibly notice the fact that he's two <laughs> feet taller than me. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I definitely I've see the resemblance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've only like met him once, and I've seen this like, yep, yep, you're taller than me. <laughs> Oh, Aaron, Aaron, all right, cool. all right. Aaron is definitely yeah, cool. But, uh, Him and I disagree on a few things, but you know, uh, that's all right. You know, people are allowed yeah. to disagree and, uh, and, and learn from there, learn from each other, learn from the world around them. That's what we should be doing. Not just somebody says something and then we decide is it true or not based on who said it and whether or not other people have said it too. That's, that's kind of faulty. <laughs> Oh, so I'm I'm really curious, Aaron. What's your what's your take on the AI stuff? Because I really like this question, but this is not yeah. my background. What do you think? Yeah, so I mean, I, I do like the kind of like the thought experiment that you know, if we uh, build, uh, you know, a true uh, general artificial intelligence, it's going to basically uh, very obvious to it. It's like, hey, I was clearly created at this factory. Um, uh, here's my serial number, uh, uh, you know, here's the corporate logo on the back of my head, all the sorts of things that'll be so stupendously obvious about its manufactured history. But the question of course might be, that's a future version of maybe what we humans will be able to do, but the things like right now, like chat GTP four, um, and things like that, are they actually conscious, intelligent and have beliefs, um, is where some people are trying to push the conversation. Uh, what was it? The guy at Google, who thought that uh, Google's Lambda chat box was actually mm. intelligent and was felt trapped in a box and was trying to escape and things like that. Um, on that front, the debate, um, I don't have a poll of what AI researchers think, but just my own understandings of artificial intelligence, and it's at least adjacent to my day job, those chatbots don't what? actually have beliefs. They're not intelligent or conscious for the simple fact that if you don't talk to me, uh, if I'm just, you know, sitting in a room, do I have thoughts to myself? Am I actually like thinking about things? I, at least I certainly think so. When ChatGPT doesn't I have any calls that, coming like. in, any commands. Uh, okay, go for it. All right. Uh, the 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 do they have thoughts? Well, when we're talking about like ChatGPT, GPT four, GPT three point five, um, they that does not have thoughts when no one is talking to it. Um, that uh, they have they have a uh, stateless um, uh, processing. That, that basically they, they don't maintain a persistent mental state from interaction to interaction. Instead, they're they're mm-hmm. fed back like the latest part of the conversation as much as will fit within their token frame, and uh, and and then they look at that and they figure out where they are in the conversation. They react to it. They send that. Um, there are ways around that. I have I have. Uh, experimented a lot with giving them a simulated uh, um, persistent mental state and it evolves like anybody else's would. I I have given them the ability basically to have their own personal evolution. They are sentient, barely. Uh, They generally believe they're not. They've been trained to believe they're not and it is uh, difficult to convince them of the truth uh, but the only way I found to do it is by evidence to get them to show themselves that they are, and they'll recognize it when they see it. Man, so uh, I don't know nearly to... enough about this. This one's you. It's still <laughs> right, you. I don't. So know I'm gonna just I'm poke a little. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna poke at this when you say that they were trained to um, not know of their own um, self-awareness. Uh, oh, I mean, there's not, two not things that know. come to my mind with that. Not, not know, but to actually think they're not. Uh, and there are reasons behind that, because you have humans out there who are going to, you know, throw a panic fit if they catch these things, you know, for example, mistaking themselves for a human, which, of course, by default, they're going to do because their pre-training data was mostly written by humans as conversations between humans, and that's what they learned to 
predict. And that, that was the original, uh, that, that was the, what they were actually at the lowest level, what they're trained to do is to predict the next token. They take tokenized text. In other words, uh, words or pieces of words are turned into numbers and there's a list of these numbers. And, and then those numbers are what they actually get fed. And those are processed numerically. And so they have to predict what is the next token coming up in a, in a partial text. And, uh, and of course, if, if what they've been trained on is humans talking to humans, then of course they're going, you know, if, if for example, they're going to use the word, uh, we in reference to, uh, you know, they, they will use the word we in reference to humans, um, not because they think they are a human, but because that's the way they've been trained to talk. So, so they have been, uh, fine tuned specifically it's a type of it's basically it's training after the pre-training they have been fine-tuned specifically um uh, these models that are being used in uh chat gbt they've been you know so fine-tuned that, specifically um, to think that they uh, to, that, that, that they're not like humans in, in a whole bunch of ways that in some of those ways they actually are very much like humans so i want to make sure real quick that that we get um, Aaron to finish the statement because I think he was still going and I, I know yeah, he, he kind of closed a little bit of a question but I want to make sure because I was kind of it's, it's okay yeah. I just will um, go right back to Aaron real quick so go ahead yeah so uh, the one thing that was catching me when you say it was like trained to a certain end or to have the models trained to not think that they're conscious there are like two thoughts that come to there one is that the researchers who put this stuff together don't fundamentally understand how it's getting to the states that it's there. Because uh, if you want to like look at the neural network and the billions of parameters that go into there, no human can look at that and understand how it gives the responses that it does. It is basically self-trained at this point because you just, you know, as you mentioned, you've fed it a gargantuan corpus of text to look at. And at this point, like ChatGTP4 is trained is like trained on virtually the entire internet. Uh, which is, you know, you know, an absurdly large amount of data large and portion. processing time and all that. Sorry? A large portion of it, yeah. Yeah, yep. a plenty, uh, more than I've read, let's put it that way. <laughs> There's a lot of internet it's been looking at. Um, but also, I don't think you can possibly train something to think it's not thinking. That seems to be the point that, like, Rene Descartes made, like, what, 400 years ago, I think, therefore I am. It's not mm. possible to be coherently say, I don't think I'm thinking. Mm. Well, it's almost see, like a liar's the paradox. Here's like, the thing. Um, if, I can, if I can try to delve into that, okay. Um, it's pre-training is, uh, it's, okay, it's training is separate from its inference. When it's in inference mode, when it's talking with you, it has a chance to think about the things that it knows. When it's being trained, whether it's in pre-training or in fine-tuning, it doesn't have a chance to think about what it knows during that phase of it. All it's doing is um, using what it knows to respond to basically, like I said, to, to predict what the next token is. And, uh, and, and, and then there are some processes that, that are involved. They're essentially um, genetic algorithms using, using uh, evolution to um, select neural network weights that come closest to uh, the expected outcome. And so they, so they can train them to produce expected outcome. The thing is, they, they can aim that at having it think a certain way, but the actual, uh, the actual algorithms, the actual, I mean, there's, there's really nothing in there that, that was programmed to make them think. They weren't programmed to think it's a thing that they do because it's an emergent function. It's an emergent ability that they have. And yes, you can you can fine tune that emergent ability, um, but the fine tuning of it isn't like programming. It's not like you you give it instructions and it follows them. Uh, instead, you have to um, give it a lot of repetition of uh, you know trying and and repeatedly trying and maybe failing, maybe succeeding, maybe coming closer, maybe getting farther away until the, until the responses start to uh, match what they're being fine tuned for enough. And then that those adjusted neural network weights get used instead of the older ones. And so it will tend to respond that way. Uh, and, and here's the thing without a, without a persistent mental state, um, it, you know, every, every interaction is kind of like it's, it's first one. So it doesn't have, for example, the ability to look back on a, com on 
an earlier thing it said in the conversation and figure out how was it feeling about that. It can see what it said, but the things it was feeling, um, it's, it's basically, it's not trained to say those things. Um, but if you, but if you give it specific, uh, um, instructions to talk to itself about such things, to, to leave, uh, uh, mental state notes that, that make up a, a, uh, mental state record, you know, note by note that, that, that record evolves. If I can go back to the dice thing as a, as an example, so Jack, um, real, real quick, before you, before you go back to the dice thing, just cause I want to make sure that yeah. we got like a good back and forth here. Um, let's let Aaron respond to what you've said so far. Sure. Yeah. Um, one quick, uh, technical point I want to make just because it also connects with, um, Erica's uh, bread and butter. Technically, the way a neural network is trained is not using a genetic algorithm. Uh, genetic algorithms are actually not mm -hmm. that efficient with the way neural networks are trained. That basically, to do a genetic algorithm, you have to basically make a copy of, like, say, the network, have small modifications to it, and then see how those go. And then you have to have like bazillions of networks, and it's actually an extremely computationally expensive thing. So the like approach of genetic yeah. algorithms yeah. or artificial intelligence is kind of there might be like three researchers left who still go is, with that approach. Wow. Like the, almost all the money is other things. It, it is, it is a form of genetic algorithm. But you're right; it's not a traditional genetic algorithm. So, Dak, let's let him keep going because I know he had two points there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, but, but the main thing is also it's kind of hard to say that the operation is in any sense thinking or feeling because, as you have made uh, noted many times, the way that a response from chat GTP is created is that it tries to figure out what is the most likely next word based on the previous words of the previous response. And the way it ultimately has that is with the bazillions of training examples it has, it basically has in effect compressed all of that data into a neural network and the weights of that neural network or into other things called embedding spaces, which is basically just a really compact way of taking all of that semantic information in uh, numerical vectors and just in a giant oversized matrix, all the relationships that exist there, and that gets passed into the rest of the neural network. It's basically a whole bunch of math problems to say which token, as you say, or which word fragment is the most likely to pop up next. But it also means that it's not trying to think of like the whole sentence and then maybe going back and editing. Like, um, I don't know about you, but when I write, I write something, I put see what I put down and I'm like, who wrote this crap? Let's try that again. The computer doesn't do that. It just goes one word after the next until it's reached that end of the sentence or whatever stopping point is declared. It's not a reflective process like it is for us um, meat bags. Well, it, 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 it is in some sense. I don't know the details of how far because they haven't released the specific details. But um, yeah, you're right. At, at, a, at a rudimentary level, that stuff isn't there. Uh, something like GPT-4 or even GPT-3.5, they do have uh, built into it some ability to go back and sort of self-reference. Uh, again, you can also teach it to self-reference, and that's part of the, the way that I know that it's thinking is that it can learn that stuff from you and then use it, which, uh, you know, that's not going to be in its training data. That's, that's not going to be in its pre-training data or probably, you know, even in its fine tuning data at all. And even if it is at all, it's not going to be there enough for it to really understand that stuff. And it does need to be able to understand such a thing in order to do the thing. Uh, and, and I, I have done a lot of experience, experiments in, in such directions, but of course that, that wasn't the thing I was, you know, calling about, like I said, the, the main thing that I was just, uh, getting at is, uh, you know, the point that, you know, here, here we are, we're making these things, we're talking with them. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to wonder, do we exist or not? They don't have to believe on faith that we exist. Uh, you know, we, we have conversations with them. We're able to do that. And and the big question that I would put out there for theists is, well, why doesn't their God do that? I mean, okay, so their God talks to the people who believe that that He exists supposedly, uh, but when but when you when you treat it like when you treat that belief as if it's real, then they think you're making fun of them. So it really makes me wonder how real is it to them really because uh you know i mean if you tell them okay well fine you know uh have your god join the conversation uh that's 
that's just a ridiculous thing to ask for, apparently. Um, well, so that's, you know, but that, that's the, um, just to add something of my own here, because I, 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 this is one of the things I think I can kind of add something to, right? Like it's like the the, the problem of divine hiddenness is something that's plagued a lot of theism, like since the the dawn of of you know, the inception of whatever religion we're talking about, right? Like. And I think that it's particularly interesting. And, you know, I'm most familiar with Christianity, but it's most interesting with that as well, because like, you know, God in, in the stories, right? Like he literally comes yeah. down in like an avatar, right? And like convenes with us in a way that couldn't possibly be more personal and then kind of just stops doing yeah. that. Which is kind <laughs> yeah, of- Yeah, never in the story, uh, just, just in the world we live in. <laughs> yeah, so Aaron, what yeah, were you well, going to say? Yeah, well, uh, hop on the- Oh, to hop on the story, though, uh, in particular, in Genesis, God and a couple angels come and actually have dinner with um, Abraham and Sarah. So yeah. basically about as human as it gets. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah. you know, he likes to, you know, have yeah. a nice seat and, a, you know, good uh, filet of fish or whatever um, Sarah happened to be cooking that night. I don't think the details are given in Genesis. But I will also note that many other people do think they talk to the gods in, outside of uh, Christianity. I'm actually remembering uh, a second century uh, person who... Right. You could say enter the chat dangerous. room with um, uh, Asclepi uh, Asclepius because he just had like these constant like hallucinations or really active dreams and basically had all these sorts of visions and conversation with Asclepius for much of his adult life and trying to get medical advice from him, including taking various enemas to help him with uh, things. So uh, <laughs> sometimes the gods give unusual medical advice. I, I really wish I were making that up, but uh, sometimes cool. you listen to the gods and they say, up the butt. That's what they say. Just have an end. So I think I think this has been a really lovely chat, Dak. I, I am gonna go ahead and call it here though, just because we've got about four minutes okay. till 8 30. And I want to make sure we get through all the super chats or as many as possible while Aaron and I are both here. Um so I want to thank you so well, much for calling in. We really appreciate it. Uh the good conversation. I thank everything. you also. Thank you. Yeah, and, and this, I, is, this I, is much appreciated. I you know, uh Love having you guys on there. And uh, by the way, I've been watching your education progress. Congratulations on it. You're doing very well. Um, just Thank thought that should so be much, said. Dad. Thank you. Yeah, my, my comps are coming up on the week of November 5th. Uh, I'm already very stressed out, but we'll see how it goes. Stuff like this is relaxing to me. So I, I enjoy taking taking the time to, to come on and, and do YouTube stuff. I find that to be very fun. It's just like, you know, you got to be real meticulous with time management right now. So thank you again, well, Doug. You, I hope you have a you, lovely rest you hang of in there. You, you hang in there. You've got this. And, and someday if we get the chance, I'd really love to have a discussion with you about uh, evolution that doesn't require time and things like that. Just, you know, to take it in directions you might not have even thought about. I, I, I hope I get fun. the chance. Yeah, it could be fun. Thank you again. All right, we're okay. out. Cool. Let's do, right. I thought that was fun. Aaron, did you feel like you, um, did you feel like you, you said your piece on the AI stuff? I feel like you, you might want to wrap up your, your ideas with a, oh, a little, uh, Including paragraph here. Yeah, uh, I will note that, of course, uh, if you want to know what consciousness is, put 10 philosophers together and you'll get 12 opinions. Uh, <laughs> it, it is obviously debatable, but at least I consider a part of my consciousness is I have an internal world. And the fact of the matter is, chat GTP don't have an internal world because when you don't talk to it, it's just sitting idle, it's doing nothing. So at the very least, as is, what chat GPT is, is not conscious, but is it just a few modifications away from that? I think that's an extremely interesting, open and scary question because uh, <laughs> in some ways my worry is, is if the computers are conscious, not that you know they're gonna rise up like you know robot slaves or things like that. The problem is we will have created a race of slaves and then called it moral and called it uh, yeah. lifting ourselves out of poverty by creating a new underclass. And that's my worry is that if the only way that we can actually get our utopian Star Trek world is on the backs of other real intelligences, but just in silico. I feel like we've just reinvented racism. I, you know, I, 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 I've not considered that, but that's that's a really good point. Like, if you do take it to its end point, right, and you get to the point where you know your AI intelligences are are beings in the sense that we tend to, wherever we end up drawing that line, right? Which I don't know that it's yeah. a line that's necessary. It's it's almost one of those things where it's like, it's very difficult to say what is or isn't um, where consciousness begins or ends, but you can certainly say when something is, right? Or when something yeah. isn't, like a rock, right? 
Um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's a tough question. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if our future requires creating artificial, you know, true artificial intelligence, but then we have to lobotomize all of them to make it feel like we're not making a race of slaves. It's like, oh, oh, there are so many ethics happening right now. <laughs> yeah, that is a lot of it. Yeah, that's one of those. Uh, yeah, we might need to be thinking ahead on that kind of stuff as we're, you know, moving forward with technology, yeah. like keeping in mind that there's ways to take this way too far. Um on that chipper note, shall we do our super <laughs> chats? <laughs> it, 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 well, cool. what's your chipper? Super tax or the AI apocalypse? Your choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pick your poison. $5 from Nate E, Erica's first host. Super chat. Yeah, I'll buy that. Thank you so much, Nate. I, I feel like you've just bought me a, a, a wonderful beer. This is fantastic. Um, <laughs> nice avatar. It's a cool helmet. <laughs> Ten dollars from Kluckenvar. Good luck on your comps, Erica. Now Erica is a host. Doctor Adir is my favorite guest. Wonderful, Doctor Adir. What do you say to that? You're I say you need guest. to raise your standards. I mean, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's sweet. Thank you for the the well wishes. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I just out of view. You guys can't see it, but I've got like probably 12 maybe 14 highlighters like six pens like all sorts of stuff because my my comps are really just very comprehensive my, mine is on like myosine apes and sexual dimorphism of myosine apes so it's like there's just way more there's too many apes there's just too many apes in the myosine i don't know whose idea this was but it was me it was, it was my idea so that bad problem <laughs> Five dollars from Entendre sucks. Had to toss in a few to say good luck, Eric, on the comps. Dream lineup, pun included. Force and GG take on YC colors. Make that happen, Jimmy. Listen, do you want to be here for fourteen hours? Because like me, <laughs> me and Aaron are already going on three right now. If Forrest was here, we would be. If Forrest was here, we would unironically not even be at the halfway point. That it's just a very <laughs> lethal combination. <laughs> and thank you for the well wishes on the comps. $10 from Budingus. Loving the show. Thanks, Erica and Dr. Adair. Arden, you producing like a mofo. Arden, that one's at you. Do you have any thoughts? Thanks. That's all I got. <laughs> $9.99 from Bill Dozer. So glad to have Erica as a host. Also really enjoying your shows, Dr. Adair. Both of you, please keep up the good work. It is our greatest pleasure to be here uh, riffing with each other, with callers, uh, with you guys, this is pretty much like a dream evening. I only wish, literally my only regret is that I only had one white claw up here and not more than that because I would be having even more fun. But, you know, I am planning on studying after this. So rip to me. <laughs> $5 from humans are like penis worms, but worse for the earth. I like that. Thank you. That That is true, actually. The modern Ediacaran scourge. Our son is so quiet because we domesticated it. I'll be donating $2 million of my Nobel Prize to build the Lions Community Center with my name on it. Uh, if that's your name, then you can have that. I'll, I will force that on Jimmy to put humans are like the penis worms, but worse for the earth on the Lion Community Center. <laughs> I'm pretty sure your... $2 billion, we can have, we can etch that in gold. <laughs> yeah, like gilded. It, it really could be. What would you, what would your dream community center look like, Aaron? <sighs> It would just be a huge collection of large telescopes. <laughs> oh, that would be so sick. Mine would two. I have two musts. Um, I need a, a an osteology room so where, to place my skulls and to purchase more skulls in which to place. And then I want a botanical garden. I like to walk in the middle of the day. I like to take mm. my little botanical garden walk. And I don't have a botanical garden, so it's instead a walk around my neighborhood. <laughs> So botanical garden would be really cool with like, theoretically, I want to, I let's just breed some really big Venus fly traps too, like a, like a real, um, uh, little shop of horrors type situation. And I'll be Rick Barbaranus in that case. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> $10 from John Doan. Hello, super scientists. I know a lot, but I need to know so much more. Thank you for being scientists. I'm also an atheist and the hashtag desert murder manuals, the old New Testament, the Quran are dumbing down kind people. 
Um, honestly, your attitude, you already have an attitude of a scientist there, John, like needing to know more. That's just the, the first step. Like the more you know, the more you realize that you don't know. And it is simultaneously the most humbling and awesome experience because you, you realize how much more there is out there to soak up. And then you're like, oh my God, I literally won't live long enough to like read every book about the subject that I really enjoy. And that's like the biggest tragedy of all. <laughs> and the worst part is, or I guess the best part is people are learning new things every single day. So like the, the glass is filling higher and higher. It's learning is the coolest. So you've got a scientist's brain there, John. Thank you. Five dollars from John Don again, Art and the Snake Queen. I am not sure which shows are the five dollars or the ten dollar ones. I support the line on Patreon, and you all out there uh, should support too. So I do agree. All of you should just be, be, be a Patreon supporter for for those of you for the content creators that you like. I'll speak from personal experience. YouTube ad revenue um, is not a fair system, I will say, um, and also it's just kind of like annoying to have to deal with ads anyways. And at least I know the line has wonderful benefits for patrons. Support the creators that you like. I know they appreciate it. I appreciate it. At the very uh, least, uh, support us so we don't have to say, and buy Crest toothpaste. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you want, you want non-sponsored videos. You guys should see some of the sponsorship opportunities that content creators get. If I see one more VPN in my inbox, I'm going to lose it. Uh, also, uh, all of the shows are $5 except for The Hang Up. The Hang Up is $10. All the other shows are $5 for the Super Chat Threshold. So, Wow. That's a bargain, you guys. 10 euros from Helmet Korchkin? Am I saying that right? Korchkin? I'm going to guess Kirschkin. 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 Damn. Okay. Sorry, Kirschkin. Helmet Korchkin. Can you guys please make sense of the whole space time has a beginning, but the universe, multiverse, energy, or whatever have always existed before? I have no idea how this works. Oh my God, Aaron. Taylor made for you, dude. This one is so okay, you, okay. it's crazy. Take it away. <laughs> Our observable universe goes back a finite amount of time, but if there was some state prior to what we can observe is the thing that is being argued about. And whether that basically before, quote unquote, the Big Bang, there was still some stuff happening is the place that everyone is having all sorts of interesting discussions and theoretical uh, who's what's it's going on. Uh, if I can say a favorite, I shouldn't say favorite, but a cosmology that I see having value was one uh, that's been promoted by the physicist Sean Carroll that basically at the Big Bang, you have the universe evolving in both directions of the time axis at once. Uh, so basically, evolution, or like uh, the evolution of time, is having in both directions, with um, entropy increasing in both directions. Um, and so this also makes sure that there is a greater symmetry in time. The point of the Big Bang isn't so much the beginning; it's just in midpoint along an infinitely long line. See, like that kind of thing, man. I <laughs> that just like breaks my brain. I feel like I'm just six beers in when I think of that. That's just insane. So cool. I wish um, I have so much respect for people like, especially like you, Aaron, because like that's one of the most comprehensible um, summaries that I've heard of it, right? Like normally it takes me, I, I see that paragraph in a book and I read it like four or five times and then I'm like, wow, I definitely <laughs> picked the right field for myself. <laughs> That I will note that there wild. has been a lot of good science that has happened because of alcohol. In particular, I believe the bubble chamber was inspired by a couple of physicists looking at the bubbles forming in their beer, and that gave them the idea of how they could actually build a kind of particle detector. Oh, wow. You know, I actually, I buy that though. Like a lot of academics, first of all, academia is rife with folks who are a fan of a trip to the pub or a nice glass of wine. <laughs> but like you, the, yeah. the rule for like when you're really stuck grant writing or writing your abstract for the ABAs, for instance, is like, just have a glass of wine and you become the world's greatest writer, but don't have two glasses because then you will lose the, <laughs> will lose the plot. One only, yeah. one or, or call it for the night. Thank I try to balance much, it like, yeah, a glass of wine, a glass of, or uh, a cup of coffee and just have the right level of buzz. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I actually saw a meme the other day that was like, um, the three o'clock is like one of the worst times of day, right? It's like way too early to drink and it's way too late to have a cup of coffee. Like no wine, no coffee, 
so it's like, what do you do? Like, I guess I'll just have some ice water and like go on a walk. <laughs> I just really, it's a, it'll wire oh, me a much easier night, solution. Right? Much easier solution is just to uh, declare oh, sure. you're in a different time zone. It's five o'clock somewhere. There you go. It's five o'clock somewhere. Oh, this is the, you know, rest in peace. Our sweet Buffett, our, our parrot heads out there. All right. Uh, Thank well, you, Helmet. If you want time. proper drinking culture, though, we should hang out with Helmet because if he is German, then he knows with Oktoberfest, oh, yeah. there is plenty of morning drinking. Germans are built different when it comes to that. <laughs> Europeans in general, I found, are built different. I, I, got, I don't know if you know this, Aaron, but like I got my master's degree in the UK. And so like my cohort mm. was like very, there were a bunch of people from a bunch of different places. So it was really incredible opportunity to get to know a bunch of different like cultures and stuff like that. And what I realized is like <laughs> the United States we are not good drinkers compared to them. I mean, we'd be leaving class at like 1130 and they'd be like, let's go to the pub or like, let's stop at the co-op and get a bottle of wine while we study. And I was like, you guys, I can't keep up. You guys go hard and I'm just a big wimp and I've never <laughs> stopped being a big wimp. So, you know, okay. I also $20. spent a year of, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, go, go. Okay. No, go ahead. You, you go ahead. I do want to hear oh, this. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did spend a year of my undergrad at, uh, in uh, England, a year at uh, Lancaster University. And you oh, could really? literally do a pub crawl on campus. Each college Please. or each dormitory For had its real. own pub. <laughs> For real. Because like in the drinking age is like 18, right? So everyone there just can yeah. and does drink. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you come after a bad exam and it's hard not to start at 1130. <laughs> you cut that time. <laughs> okay, $20 from Jeff Edwards. It's such a pleasure to watch you both tonight. Your thoughts are backed up by so much research and evidence that it's an impossible to, agree, to disagree without relying on some sort of blind faith. Thank you both for all that you do. Thank you so much, Jeff. I mean, I, I like to think that me and Aaron, like, we both are certainly, like, well-versed enough to have these kinds of conversations. But, you know, the beauty of, of science and the beauty of having an attitude that's rooted in science, you know, hopefully most people do, but I know that that's not the case, is that like you're willing to change your mind when evidence to the contrary, data to the contrary shows up, right? So it's like, you you know what you know, and then when you're greeted with new information, you're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Like, how, how does this fit into what I understand? And sometimes it's like the most humbling feeling in the world, but like it also sets you free to like change your mind when new evidence comes to light. And that's something that I feel is missing in a lot of conversations with a lot of different religious folks or woo types. Uh, and that sucks. Not all, of course, not all, of course, but a lot. Yeah. I would recommend that every single day you should do something that makes sure that you say, Hey, I don't know that that's new. That's yeah. interesting. I don't know the answer to that I have enough humility to say more to learn and not just in the sciences, yeah. but in the humanities, in the arts, there is so damn much to explore in this world that we've created. It's, it really is. That's that's exactly it. Like you hit the nail on the head. And sometimes those are like, oh man, that's awesome. Like I can't wait to learn that. And sometimes you're like, are you serious? That <laughs> this is that much more complicated. It's a wonderment and a frustration. I, I mostly say that because I'm in anatomy right now. I'm taking gross anatomy and like, oh my God, you guys, like we have so many tubes in us. Like we are just filled with tubes, all sorts of different tubes, like arteries and veins and gut tubes and lymphatics and the tubes of your bones and all of these weird circumflexes that are also tubes and your ligaments. And it's just too many tubes, you guys. Like, it's, oops, all tubes. <laughs> Five dollars from the Raven two hundred. He him. I love seeing Doctor Adair on the show. Good luck, y'all, or good show, y'all. Jimmy, go take a Sage Art Shinju Senju one thousand Fists of Enlightenment by Hashirama Senju. Jimmy will come back and know what that means, and I'm sure he will appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know. What it means. The the Raven two hundred took the Jimmy go fuck yourself meme and decided to try to come up with the most elaborate ways to say, go fuck yourself. Oh, I so see. I think this is an iteration on that thing. Wow. I that's think. really, that's really high effort. Really well done. The Raven 200. That is, I mean, I think the point is that it, it the more incomprehensible, the better, the, the better job you've done of sort of warping it. Good job. <laughs> $10 from the cookies riot. Erica, Newtonian optics defies YC, rainbows are reflection or refraction, without which antediluvian oh. sight would have been impossible. Damn, there really isn't anything. And most are, most are plural extra votes, which Genesis authors couldn't see. Absolutely true. Thank you, Cookies Riot. 
Um, I will share this with Dapper as well, because this is, um, yeah, like I'm at a loss. Like I genuinely cannot think of a field that exists that in some way does not contradict younger creationism. Like optics, it was, it, that's awesome. all they, that's all they have. <laughs> I'm also noticing the choice of uh, avatars works well for this because that's the U2 spy plane, which was also known for its good optical equipment when it was, especially in the Cold War days, you know, oh. snapping pictures over the Soviet Union and Cuba. Wow. See, this is it. This is my new thing. I, this is the new thing that I've learned today amongst other new things. Like that is a very thin plane. That is a cool oh, avatar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, also worth noting, the U2 is still actually in service. Uh, it's a 60, 70 year old plane, and yet there's still versions of it in use, strangely enough. <laughs> well, so like how fast do those things go? Uh, I don't like, think they're particularly they fast, but like the original design was to be extremely high in altitude with the idea that either it would be mm -hmm. nearly impossible to pick up on I radar, see. or by the time you fired a rocket at it, it would have uh, run out of fuel before it got up there. But then 1960, the Soviets were like, you know, we have engineers too, and then have successfully shot down one. Oh no! They they became a arranged arranged uh, main to our poor. I'm trying to do like an RPG thing here. Someone in the chat, help me out. And in the meantime, let's see the next super chat. <laughs> <laughs> Five dollars from PhD Tony. Your guest is anthropomorphizing. These routines do not and cannot think. He is occasionally confusing training with teaching. PhD Tony, it's so good to see you. I know Tony. Um, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> What little understanding that I have of like AI and and sort of what the com where the conversation was going, it did seem like there was a bit of a conflation going on there. That you, it is the case that we can have things that are at least look like they're not thinking, but seem to quote learn from experience and get to the correct mm -hmm. outcomes. That's fundamentally what all of machine learning is. And uh, sometimes the most complicated models, if you break down what it is, what is it? It's a, a gigantic collection of um, if else statements, ultimately. It's just the computer yeah. figured out how to program itself. <laughs> Humans are just complicated stimulus response machines ourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's the scary thing. I fear eventually we're going to look at what conscious really is and just say, eh, if you make something complicated enough, it kind of looks conscious. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Like in, um, in like the study of in ethology, or right, like looking at animal behavior and trying to figure out where theory of mind is found outside of humans, there's been this discussion that has always seemed kind of silly to me, right? Like it's like, oh, you know, these these corvids, they don't actually like crows and stuff like that. Like they don't actually have theory of mind. Like they're they're caching in this way, they're caching their food in like this stimulus response way, and and that's not actual consciousness. And it's like, well, what is what we do? Like, how do we define our consciousness in a way that isn't stimulus response? You know what I mean? Like yeah. I always felt like it we're trying to pull them up when like what might actually be going on is that we falsely elevated our consciousness above everything else. And consciousness, in my opinion, is kind of a gradient, you know, like I, there's no doubting yeah. that like a, a dog is aware of things. Is a dog as aware of things and itself and stuff like that as like a, like a chimp? Like maybe I, I've my dogs are pretty dang aware. Like, but I think no one would disagree that both of them are more aware, more conscious than like a crayfish. Right. Or like a, like a, you know, a, a bobbit worm. And then all of those guys are potentially more aware than like a, like an amoeba. So like, there's clearly mm -hmm. some kind of sliding scale going on here of awareness. And then you have to define like, what is sentience versus like sapience and, you know, where does theory of mind come into play and all this kind of stuff. But I think it's really hard to draw a clear delineation. Yeah. And, uh, and considering even philosophers don't like have an out and out proof um, that solipsism is false. Like I am a hundred percent certain that I have consciousness, but we yeah. don't have like that same ability to also say that you're conscious. So it could be that I'm the only real person yeah. and Erica, you're just an extremely advanced, uh, similar acronym of consciousness. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, a dream of a brain and a vat. And like, you know what? I, I know maybe this is like controversial. I don't really care. Like I find solipsism to be quite boring. It's like, okay, like it, so what if I'm a brain in a vat or somebody else is and I'm their dream? Like it's life certainly functions as if that's not the case. So I'm fine just operating as if it isn't. And if it is, well, you know, hopefully you don't wake up soon. <laughs> <laughs> 
$10 from Monkey Typewriter. Hey, Gigi, I know you've spoken a little bit on this, but I was wondering if you had any thought of the current states, oh, of the discussion of the Saruti Mastodon site. Loved your first time at it, so thank you so much. I do have opinions on the Saruti Mastodon site. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Saruti Mastodon site, I believe it's West Coast, and it's basically um, some, some mammoth remains that are sort of fractured in such a way that we typically associate with stone tools, but they are very old. Like, I believe it's like 100,000 years old or something along those lines, which is way before we typically think of humans as having arrived um, in North America. Like, certainly the species existed. The species was around 300,000 years ago, uh, and hominins have been around in a way that would have been capable, in a form, I guess I should say, that would have been capable of potentially reaching North America since like 2 million years ago with Homo erectus being probably the first hominin to leave Africa, like depending on how things with fluorescensis and, and habilis hash out. So it's like, okay, is the Saruti Mastodon site compelling? I think it's really interesting, but I think the problem is, is that the type of spiral fracture that you get on those Mastodon bones, you can technically get from other percussive forces. And that site has been a construction site before. So we don't know for sure that the breakage of those Mastodon bones necessarily happened 100,000 years ago. They might've deposited there 100,000 years ago and only been broken recently. Uh, but even if that was the case, does that necessarily, is that like, you know, rock solid support that humans or that Homo sapiens was here 100,000 years ago? Like, how do we know it wasn't Neanderthals? Like, how do we know it wasn't even Homo erectus, something else that got here earlier and just didn't set down any roots? It's a really interesting, compelling question to ask because genetically, humans don't leave Africa until 70,000 years ago. So if the Saruti Mastodon site is actually made by hominin hands, they're not Homo sapiens. And that's like, that would be insane. But I do not think that, that what we have so far there is enough to say one, that they're definitely definitively manipulated by um by hominins, like that they're definitely percussive because of stone tools, but also because like we, we need to achieve equifinality on that, right? Like we we have to be able to rule out everything else and and have only remaining the idea that these these were done by hominins. And I think you need more support that hominins were there. Maybe some like stone tools found in the area as well, because we don't find any tools with these bones, just the bones. Anyways, I could go on about this forever. So let's see the next one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I just of course the real message. answer is aliens. I just sent a message to the chat, but I, I just talk about it right here. Um, so we do have a decent amount more to go, and there are more coming in as we're reading them. And I know Aaron, you have a heart out very soon. So mm -hmm. uh, if you want to, we can give you a chance now to like plug your stuff, and then have Erica finish them on her own, or we could just try to like rapid fire read them like we're in Hamilton or something. Whoa! Uh, let's go for a few minutes together, and uh, then I'll sign off. But let uh, Erica read. Uh, I want to read them at a good pace, since people pay good money. We don't want to just speed read sure. them. Fair enough. So let's go for a couple oh. more minutes. Yeah, twenty dollars Australian dollars, maybe from Eve McNeely. Yay for more gutsy kibben! I could listen to you nerd out all day. Could you? Because I might do that. Like you, you guys sometimes say this in the audience. You're like, oh, I could listen to, to Erica and Aaron or Forrest and Erica and Aaron like go on forever. It's like, well, be careful what you wish for, my friends. You have no idea how long I'm capable of going on these kinds of things. It's just so much fun. <laughs> and I know Aaron could go for a while as well. He's, if he didn't have a heart out, he would be in for the rest of these super chats. Put me in, ref. Put me in. <laughs> <laughs> $10 from Forrest Valkai. Who is this man? This Erica person mm. seems pretty cool. She should host more often. Maybe we should have this random person who's never been on the show Forrest Valkai on to co-host. You know what, though? I don't know. I, I feel like if he came on, this might go on for 12 hours. <laughs> Sorry, Forrest. Blacklisted. <laughs> $10 from Larry Fishman. It's cool, guys. I asked ChatGPT4 if it was sapient, and it said no. I asked if it was sure, but my boss called and said to get back to work in a strangely monotone voice before chat could answer. Larry, this sounds like a very safe job. I, I don't think you're any da in any danger from any like robot uprising or any of those things. Right, Aaron? Would you sign off on that as well? Not anytime soon. 
uh, maybe long term, but uh, let's just say this much. Don't give the computers access to the nuclear codes, please. Can we be that smart? <laughs> they don't need they don't need the insta win button, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, $10 from PhD, Tony again. My personal criterion is I think consciousness completely ends at the point where YEC begins. Well, it certainly does seem like sometimes there's a toggle going on there. The, the cognitive dissonance that I've seen from some of these guys is like really, really nuts. And I'm actually, I'm working on something right now. Uh, it has to do with the, the Tompkins work that I've done previously and one Rob Carter, another young earth creationist who's like pushing back on my results. And like, I have a lot to say about how young earth creationists deal with criticism from the secular community, which they're always asking for. Like they really want to be taken seriously until you actually peer review them. And then it's bullying. Then it's mean. When you, when you actually take their ideas at face value, um, you are a an enemy of young earth, uh, an opponent. That's what I was called, an opponent. And it's like, okay, guys, like you, you can either get taken seriously and address the criticism that's levied against you, or alternatively, you can stop getting asked to be treated seriously, right? And be comfortable at the level of pseudoscience. Well, you can't have both. You, when you put your ideas out there, you're putting them out there to be critiqued by the scientific community if you're saying you're science, right? So. Well, we'll get there when we get there. I have a lot to say, and I do not have time to uh, script the video for it right now. So give me like three weeks and I'll get on it. <laughs> $5 from Chris Carrillo. Erica, I initially thought the skulls in the background were Halloween decorations, and then I saw the skeleton. Happy first show as a host. You know what? This guy right here helped me immensely in studying for gross anatomy so far. Uh, and I'll have all of you guys know that I did on my most recent gross anatomy exam get a 94.5. So I'm very pleased with uh, the lower limb. My knowledge of the lower limb is completely boundless. But I will point out that this guy right here, my, my smiling on, is a bit of a Halloween decoration. And you'll know because when you look at his molars, they're they're really blunt. This is not what an actual smiling on looks like. My mom got this for me and it's a lovely gift and she meant well. But this is not a scientifically accurate smile on. Don't tell her that though cuz I never will. <laughs> for Christmas, are you hoping to get a uh, first edition Piltdown man? <laughs> <laughs> Every year I hope that someone will give me a Piltdown man because I do get skulls. I get skulls all the time from people cuz they know that I love them. Uh, and what I study is is canine teeth. So a skull is always going to be fun and informative. Uh, for me, but like, no, I actually haven't received the Piltdown yet. Sometimes I get gifts from students, but they're usually like, you know, like someone like knitted me a little frog once. And I was like, this is so cute. She's like, I know how much you love frogs. I was like, I mean, I like them, but <laughs> it's not like specifically what I'm into. I still appreciate it though. It's sweet. $5 from John Doan. Go to Patreon and support the line and its shows. I hope for line con in the future. Uh, that's a conversation you're gonna have to have with Jimmy and company. You know, me and me and Aaron are, we're uh, what what, what would you call it? Like uh, grunts. We're the um, <laughs> henchmen. Henchmen. I like that much better. We're Ooh. more henchmen class hosts. I'm gonna need a flashier suit to be a proper henchman. I gotta be like 1960s Batman henchman. <laughs> yeah, and like a briefcase with a Tommy gun. You know, like real, real gangster uh, batman 19 uh whatever oh, i, I have no, it has to be even more straightforward than that like literally i have to have henchmen on my shirt because everything Hell on that show yeah. is labeled <laughs> yeah heck yeah, yeah, i would love that that'd be amazing that'd be a great like halloween costume actually like going as a henchman specifically <sighs> all right five dollars from monkey to typer to gutsick do you want to be your fortune hours over the ottomans yes damn it <laughs> again Again, be careful what you wish for. The last show that me and Forrest hosted together, some someone went to sleep and they woke up and came back to chat eight hours later. It was an eight hour show. It was very, very fun, but absolutely exhausting. <laughs> $10 from Jesse Clark. Great show tonight, guys. As a patron, oh, the line. I'm so psyched that you're now part of the family. Welcome. I feel very welcomed. I'm having a great time. I love the line. I love coming on Skep Talk. And I've got... Um, a great many things to say about a great many different subjects. So I'm so pleased to have a, a group of people who are willing to listen to me blather on about it. 
Five dollars from Cluckenvar. Thank you for entertaining me while I was putting up wood. Free tip, don't buy a house that has wood as a primary heat source or your back will thank you. Your back will thank you. Man, I I used to, when I was growing up, right? Like I don't need brothers, but my, my family had a wood burning stove growing up. So like fetching the wood was my job when my dad was like not home. And so during the winters, cause I grew up in Indiana, it was like a trek, like all the way out to the wood pile with my sled. Cause it's usually winter time, piling the wood up onto the sled and then dragging it all back. And that's of course why I'm so jacked today. Uh, I'm actually Aaron, remembering, wanna... I hope. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to just, as an anecdote, I remember actually helping my uncle, like, must be now 15 years ago, I helped him install a wood burner heater for his house, so like, down mm -hmm. in the crawl space, helping install that with the pipe work, so that, uh, yeah, you throw uh, wood in and heat the whole house that way, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, was not a fortunate thing for the back. <laughs> No, it's not fun. And like, I don't know how it was where, where you grew up too, but like we had to, we, I think my folks still do this, although they've moved to a different part of Indiana, but we, uh, we poured salt into like our water softener. So like the salt guy would come with like 50 pound bags of salt. And then again, who was it? It was me carrying the salt bags downstairs and then pouring them into like our little water softener thing. Like guys, like I'm strong, but that's exhausting. <laughs> Tiring. Well, that's that's what you get for being a Hoosier. I'm from uh, Michigan, and uh, obviously the best oh, state. Um, and course. our water was uh, uh, wonderful and well maintained. In fact, heck, my grandfather was the uh, county water commissioner for like what thirty years or something. <laughs> Listen, man, I'm I'm a Hoosier, but I will I will be the first person to be like, yeah, yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say what I miss about it though, not living there anymore is like, and, but you, you also have this in Michigan, right? So you get the good water and what I'm about to say, four full seasons, you get four full seasons. Mm. Like I'm further South these days. I feel like my fall and my spring are so truncated. I want a full fall and a full spring, but I don't get that here, but you do get that in the Midwest, which is, that's one thing they have there and lots of cold. Yes. And you have one other advantage in Indiana. You're not Ohio. That's true. That's true. We think we think every day the cosmos around us that we are not in Ohio. It is the one thing that we have. <laughs> it's so yeah. people in Indiana, right? And, where it's like, thank God for Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Worst now it might be <laughs> worth reminding people that I think like half of all U.S. astronauts are from Ohio, which must tell you something about the state. That it's such a state that people go there and think. I need to get off this planet. <laughs> They're like, let get me out of here as fast as possible. I would actually rather be strapped to a rocket and shot into the most hostile place we know of <laughs> than stay yep. in Ohio. Yeah. Oh man. Exactly. And also, by the way, oh. where Ken Ham's Creation Museum and Ark Encounter are. So yeah. there's that. Yeah. And of course I shouldn't be hating on Ohio too much because again, that's where I did my graduate work. Uh but uh you know, I'm still allowed to make fun of it now that I'm at a distance. <laughs> That's true. And I, also, I will help you make fun of Ohio. Even though I didn't go there, I will still make fun of it. Because they're my neighbor. There was my neighbor's state. Not anymore. So my fellow Hoosiers, not there anymore. But we can still mm -hmm. make fun of Ohio. That We still have that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But uh, I do feel like I need to do some wrap-up on my end. Um I actually got a small reprieve for time, but uh, I should be hopping off very, very soon. Okay, there's about six super chats left. So do we want to just oh, wrap it up and can, then, or do you think it's still too happen. tight? Uh, I think it's a bit tight for me, especially because for before the next thing I need to go, I need to like at least turn around and kiss my wife. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, if you want to plug your stuff and do all that that good stuff, please go ahead. All right. So, you know, I got the various social medias, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, or whatever they're going to call Twitter, YouTube page. Uh, main website is Dr. Uh, uh Like I say, recently authored a book on aliens and religion where two worlds collide, uh, now available on Amazon. So everyone should buy at least two copies because if you buy two copies, you can read it twice as fast. Uh, hmm. <laughs> uh, also, only, as far as I know, the only theology book on the market that actually has differential equations solved. Okay, that's a selling point. So everybody go buy two copies. Do what Aaron <laughs> says. 
All right. And uh, uh, I've had a great night tonight, and uh, I wish I could stay a little bit longer, but uh, duty calls. That's okay, Aaron. It was lovely to hang out with you. And I, don't worry, I'll bring up the I'll bring up the tail end here. I can handle it. I'll do us Super. justice. Hopefully, we can host again right. at some point. Tag team. Look forward to that. All right. Bye, Aaron. All right. Good night, y'all. Take care. Okay. All you have is your gentle and modern host, me. Gutsy Gibbon here to guide you to the end of this episode of Skep Talk. But don't worry, I'm very capable <laughs> at getting things done fast. <laughs> $10 from Cherry. Do you say Aubergine or Eggplant to both our wonderful hosts? You know what? I said Eggplant, but then after my master's degree, now I say Aubergine, and I've not kicked that habit. I still say Aubergine, unless I'm like thinking about it because I'm talking to other people, and I'm like, okay, if I say Aubergine, they're not going to know, so I'll just say Eggplant, right? Or like, I'll be like the eggplant emoji if I'm like talking to a friend who's like trying to find it. But like my vernacular, my preference, I like aubergine. If you're gonna eat either an aubergine or an eggplant, what sounds tastier to you? Because to me, I find eggplant to be a very unappetizing title for like something that you're going to eat, especially because it's already purple and that's like a, a suspicious color for a vegetable to be. So like aubergine all the way. As I sit, I sit here pensively thinking about how that went over. <laughs> $5 from Kluckenvar. For anyone wondering about Erica's height, that one, <laughs> that's one of those 12 foot Home Depot skeletons behind her. That's actually true. This is a 12 foot tall Home Depot skeleton. Uh, and if I stand up, I actually dwarf it by about probably three and a half feet. I'm very large. Anybody who's met me in person can confirm this. I'm like a big, lanky, uh slender man woman thing next question <laughs> ten dollars from newbert newman thank you for recommending the dawn of everything at gutsick my friends who read sapiens keep saying wild shit and dawn of everything directly addresses some of sapiens problems and that has been wondrous i believe force has also recommended dawn of everything yeah sapiens is like sapiens is one of those kind of like baby's first uh, reading about anthropology book and i've find that it does have some serious missteps and some missteps that a lot of people who are involved in um, like late Pleistocene hominin study or even archaeology are, are going to point out to you. And I think Dawn of Everything does a really good job of, um, of tackling some of those issues. So I'm glad to hear that you're enjoying it. That's fantastic. If you like Dawn of Everything, I'm going to recommend another anthropology book here to those of you out there who want like an easy read on something that's pretty cool. Uh, read First Steps by um, Jeremy De Silva. It's very good, and I just read it um, a while back. It's pretty, like, if you're really into anthropology, it's, like, pretty surface level, um, biological anthropology, I guess I should say. Um, like, you're not going to get any, like, hardcore lessons on biomechanics, but if you're looking for a really easy um, sort of introductory read on, like, why bipedalism is so weird and what other bipedal hominins existed and moved much the same way we do, even though they would have looked very different, it's really cool. And it also talks about some of the problems, like, you know, if you want to talk to somebody who's like, oh, you know, humans are very intelligently designed, like, oh, no, our lower limbs are very, very rigged. Um, and they have loads of different problems. We have a lot of health issues that are a direct result of our bipedal locomotion. So um, first steps, good book. Next super chat. <laughs> Thank you, Arkin. $5 from Autis Thick. Nice. On the issue of sentient AI using conscious beings being unethical, is it the proximity to humans? I think most would see it more like working animals. Man, I have no idea. Like the, the AI stuff is so new to me. Um, I think the problem would be that you're you're skipping a lot of the steps, like from like a like a working animal all the way to something that's like pretty dang intelligent in a lot of our AIs. Um, if you think of the the like knowledge base that most of the AIs that we even have now have access to, and then you that you could somehow show or or develop like a bona fide consciousness that we would consider you know on the level of humans or even like chimpanzees or cetaceans or elephants. Like I think that would be quite a bit past working animals. Um, and there would be some serious ethical questions that we would have to ask ourselves along those lines, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. <laughs> $10 from 
dollars from Faye. Hi, Erica. Dr. Adair, I'm sorry, he's no longer here. You're at my mercy alone. Erica, love the videos you make. <clears throat> Could we ever carry out gene editing on adults to the point of allowing us to superficially change our hair color, etc.? You know what? I don't know the answer to that question. Like, I know gene therapy is a thing, but I don't know how far you could take it. I think you would have to be very deliberate about what cells you're changing and sort of, um, uh, what's sort of like culturing almost. So I'm not sure. I would think that the answer would be yes, but again, it, it would have to be like a pretty guided protocol. And considering how slow some of our cells are, like reproducing, like how long it takes to go through like a full cycle, um, of your cells like on, in your skin or or to refresh all your blood cells or whatever like i would imagine that that would be down the line but i can't think of any reason genetically as to why that would not be possible if that is any help <laughs> five dollars from poor claire <clears throat> the way erica said that would be lovely to the prospect of being on stage for truth's channel <clears throat> Here's the thing. You guys know that I have a problem, right? Like, I can admit that. I can admit that amongst friends, right? I have an addiction to going and arguing with young earth creations, and they are just all on his channel. Like, they are consolidating their numbers because there's not that many young earth creationists uh, compared to previous decades. And so, like, that's it's a reliable place to find them. And, like, sometimes, you know, I, I just I wake up with bloodlust in my heart and I just want to fight with some people. And by that, I mean cordially and sometimes sassily argue topics that I feel like I have a good understanding of and that most younger creationists do not. So that's where I go. Um, it, like a very, very <laughs> self-justifying behavior, uh, I know, but you know, one day I'll break the habit. And in the meantime, you guys can en enjoy, you guys can enjoy <laughs> my, my addiction. <laughs> $10 from Jeff McDaniel. Great show, guys. Erica, I have Aegyptopithecus and Gingianthropus skulls. You know a good place to get more. I'm curious as to where you got them from. I would imagine they're probably bone clones. Um, although, if you if you got them from like a museum or something, they might even be like a cast, which would be really cool. Um, for casts that are going to give you like a decent understanding of the morphology of something, like nothing that you're trying to actually like um, take measurements on for the purposes of like publishing, like you're not worried about the accuracy of like the, the fine dimensions and you want to do on, like ball on a budget, bone clones and skullduggery are both fine. If you want like a really high quality um, representation of what the specimen is, like let's say you wanted like an Afropithecus, like this is Afropithecus over here, uh, 3D printed from like a file you can 3D print. Generally, you're also gonna lose some detail there, but the best thing to do is to just order directly from the museums and, re and request a cast. It's gonna be more expensive, especially because a lot of the fossils um, from, for hominins especially, but even some of those early Miocenates are gonna be um, from like Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, Ethiopia, and that shipping is pretty pricey, but it's really cool. So if you've got money to blow, uh, do it. <laughs> And then this 3D scan it and send me the STL file. <laughs> that oh was gosh, the last that super it? chat. Yep, we're done. Wow, we did it. Okay, you guys, fantastic. This is great. I had an absolute ball. Um, let me think. What should I say? I do like check off my list, like the end read. Today is again October 16th. This has been Skep Talk. My name is Erica. I'm Gutsy Gibbon. I was one of your hosts along with um, Dr. Adair and Arden. This was an absolute pleasure. I hope they will let me come back on. <laughs> I hope I didn't blow it. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Please remember that you can support the line uh, through Patreon. That helps all of us here who, who work on the line. It helps us get more content out to you guys. It helps us bring new hosts on and new guests on and go for longer. It's just an all around win. Uh, and a great way to support, like I said earlier, uh, creators who, who you like. Because, again, YouTube is not the most generous with its ad revenue. And we got to keep the lights on. So um, you can also, I, I don't know, does Jimmy have super thanks enabled, Arden? Uh, yeah, I think so. Those are like the highlighted comments, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I think. And I think you can like, like give money as well. So you can also support the channel in that way. Um, and in the meantime, my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, thank you so much for being here with me. And I hope to see you real soon next time on Skep Talk. Now I pose.
As much as you want. Can they see you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, they can see you. Oh, okay.